Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Yeah, come on, Daryl. Just, uh, it was just a way to make you quickly join us. <laughs> so it's, it's at the end. So yeah, thanks for joining us for this scheduler microconf. Yeah. Uh, we'll have two slots of one hour and a half, uh, starting with the core scheduling, and then it's the proxy execution. Let me check. Uh, then the scheduled line and kernel thread. Then we'll have a break. Um, a talk on the load balance rework, flattening the hierarchy, the scheduler domain and the cache bandwidth from um, Valentin. Uh, we will have some uh, discussion on TurboSCAD and we'll finish with the task uh, latency nice. So don't hesitate to ask questions. The goal is really to interact, raise problem. Yes. It's not a presentation, that's a discussion. So I think we are just on time, maybe waiting a few more minutes for Daval to. We will uh, display the, the note. Yeah, two minutes? Okay. Just wait for two more minutes. We have a whiteboard if you want to draw something. Yeah, don't hesitate to take notes on the etapad. That help us to remind two weeks or three weeks after what we said. And then I think that if there is not enough time, I mean, we can continue some discussion on the hallway. <coughs> up, to, up to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I already said that. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, here is the link for the Etherpad to take the note. Don't, hesi don't hesitate to, to connect and add your, your understanding of the microconf. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, if at some point everything is clear, we can move to the next topic earlier. But yeah. And if you take too much time, we will warn you that no, the time is running and you will have to. Yeah. I can start? Can I start? Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. So today we are going to talk about core scheduling. Uh, as you may have heard, there have been a couple of security vulnerabilities in <laughs> the past year so and years. And one of them, the two of them, maybe affect uh, iPad trading. So the idea was uh, sent about a year ago on LKML about having core scheduling, so to be able to uh, group tasks of the same trust domain on the same core, and that way avoid uh, leaking data from one process to the other without having to disable hyper-trading because of the performance implications. So that's the main idea, so grouping trusted tasks 
and find quickly trusted, trusted task to run on the same core. If we don't find two tasks that can run at the same time on the same core, we force idle the, uh, on the other sibling. That way we guarantee only one, uh, and, uh, we keep the security implication. And we also want to load balance between CPUs to pull uh, tasks that are compatible and then run on the same CPU, on the same core, instead of being spread and having to force idle a lot of time. So today it's not really a presentation, it's just we want to look at what are the next steps because we are now the uh, third version. We have a few issues to fix, but now we really want to look into how we can mainline this. So that's more of a discussion because one of the concerns is uh, that MDS in particular has uh, another implication that it would require synchronization points on system calls, interrupts, and also as well as VM, VM exit. For L1TF, VM exit are enough, and for VM only workloads, L uh, VM exit are also enough. But we know that there are uh, performance implications of adding additional synchronization points on system call and interrupts. So I think that's the main topic we want to address today is that. And we want also to hear from you if you have other ideas or roadblocks or things you want to, to see to mainline this feature. So that's my part. After that, we will have a performance discussion and also uh, another idea on the same concept uh, based by uh, of our co-scheduling instead of core scheduling. So now let's discuss. <laughs> okay, sh should we first uh, do the presentation? Okay, <laughs> so we can discuss after. <laughs> So uh, hi everybody, uh, I'm Shubhra and I work in Oracle Linux. So when all this MDS stuff uh, came out, uh, while uh, uh, virtual machines was one use case definitely even for us, uh, the other use case uh, that we had was uh, for database. So Oracle database uh, has uh, its own kind of virtualization technology uh, called Oracle Multi-Tenant where uh, uh, root database can uh, house multiple uh, lightweight uh, pluggable databases, as we call them. And uh, so in this case, you can imagine like uh, uh, hundreds or even thousands of uh, such uh, pluggable database or PDBs uh, will run in the one system. And if somehow one PDB is able to run some uh, untrusted code, it can leak uh, data from uh, other tenant PDBs in the same host. Uh, so, uh, so we, uh, for, for the, for the per, uh, from the performance uh, testing point of view, uh, we started testing with uh, the database use case uh, when uh, Peter first uh, posted his patches. And I have been testing constant, consistently for V2 and V3. Uh, it has more or less remained the same uh, for from V1, uh, barring like uh, some corner cases that I think the DigitalOcean folks were seeing. But uh, for my test case, I didn't see much uh, difference so far from V1 to V3. Uh, so uh, in this slide, I'm, what I'm showing is uh, two DB instances. So think of them as two PDB instances uh, which are running on the same host, which is a, a 44 core two socket uh, x86 uh, system. So each is running uh, a OLTP uh, workload. So I use TPCC for this. And uh, so the idea was to compare how much performance we are losing uh, with respect to uh, the baseline, which is uh, not using any core scheduling. And the percentage gain uh, column, so uh, firstly, I varied the number of users uh, just to ramp up the load a little bit. And at 32 users, I think the total uh, system utilization was around 50%. And if you can see uh, the percentage gain, which is uh, all negative, so we see, we are seeing uh, uh, substantial performance loss uh, because uh, mostly of uh, the forced idleness that the core scheduler is uh, uh, forcing certain uh, hyper threads to because it cannot find matching tasks. And it goes all the way up to like 30% regression for uh, 32 users. And I also have the, the uh, percentage idle baseline and the percentage idle, which is the core scheduling column. 
and as you can see, uh, the idleness has gone up uh, quite a bit compared to the baseline. So, uh, so while there is extra work being done for code scheduling like uh, enqueuing and dequeuing from a separate run queue, uh, but I think uh, uh, the idleness is actually one of the major uh, sources of uh, regression. And because the differences are, uh, of idleness are pretty huge. So unless we can uh, cover that gap, uh, probably we won't get uh, much closer uh, to the performance. So, uh, so I think that uh, as the patch stands today, uh, one change that we need to add further is uh, also change the wake-up path, uh, because currently uh, there is uh, uh, no matching of cooking, uh, cookie uh, is attempted uh, when a thread is uh, woken up. So it just uh, uses the same uh, code path as before. So there is no, uh, it's like putting randomly uh, threads uh, to course. And the other thing also that doesn't help is uh, uh, currently the scheduler first tries to spread across cores and then it tries to find idle CPUs or idle siblings. Uh, so spreading across course is basically doing the exact opposite of uh, it's minimizing the uh, probability of uh, trying to pack uh, matching cookies into the course. Uh, so uh, I'm hoping that once we have this change, probably some of the gap will be closed and we'll uh, get the regression uh, further down. And the other column that I have, uh, the last column, is actually the experiment with uh, no SMT. So basically disable... Uh, uh, a hyperthread in each core. And as you can see, uh, in for the lower users, actually you uh, gain uh, performance compared to the baseline. And this is not something uh, unusual. Uh, there was actually a, a very long email from Mail Gorman who sent a lot of performance uh, data of uh, difference benchmarks. And he showed that uh, uh, it's all over the place. Uh, disabling HD is not like a sure shot of losing performance. To gain performance in many cases, you lose, and the reasons behind that can be varied. Uh, so it's it's not an easy answer that you disable HD. Uh, it's as always a bad idea. And uh, finally, uh, for 32 users, actually, you see we uh, suddenly uh, see the performance cliff with uh, HD disable. That's because like the number of threads have gone up so much that now you are short of uh, CPUs, uh, but it's still, uh, the loss is not so much as uh, core scheduling. Uh, so, so yeah, right now, like the jury is still out, like what is the right approach? Uh, at least for this uh, use case, uh, uh, maybe disabling hyper-threading uh, uh, could be the right solution. So uh, this is where things stand as of now. Uh, so we are, uh, hopefully attempt more improvement of performance uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, so that was the only slide I had. Uh, I think Aubrey will talk next. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Aubrey. I come from uh, Intel Open Source Technology Center. And uh, today's topic, uh, is actually a core scaling application. Uh, uh, this topic actually from a uh, uh, customer in China. So uh, when to, uh, they want to improve their server machines utilization. So they collocated some uh, latency critical workload with uh, their uh, some, some kind of best effort workload. And uh, uh, those best effort workload typically uh, is uh, deep learning training, deep learning training uh, uh, workload. And they found uh, uh, their latency of latency critical workload is, is affected by the uh, best effort uh, workload. And we have them to uh, figure out that uh, AVX512 is a major, uh, is a major cause. So uh, the AVX512 instructions can uh, accelerate the uh, compute the intensity workload. Uh, the best case we, we saw uh, uh, by Limpack and the FPU Julia benchmark, we, we, we see the improvement is up to uh, 30%. And I ever run uh, an uh, image recognition uh, training uh, uh, benchmark over TensorFlow, 
and I s actually saw uh, a 30% uh, improvement. So uh, comparing to uh, AVX2, the AVX512 instructions use wider uh, vector instructions and uh, wider registers. So it often can uh, improve the throughput, but um, it also can temporarily draw large amounts of uh, additional current on CPU. So um, that means it will uh, consume more power, but the power budget is limited. So uh, when uh, AVX512 is running on the core, the course uh, max frequency will be reduced. So if, uh, if we look at uh, the picture on the right side, if there's two core running AVX512 and its frequency is uh, 3.5 gigahertz, but if they run uh, non-AVX tasks, uh, the frequency can, uh, can be 3.8 gigahertz. So things get worse uh, if there are more active cores uh, running on AVX512. So for good case, we can see uh, uh, if non-AVX and, and AVX are separated on two different cores, so everyone, I think everyone is happy. But uh, for the bad case, uh, if AVX and non-AVX is mixed together on the same core at the same time, uh, the AVX task is, is not affected, but non-AVX uh, task is affected. Its frequency is reduced, so its performance, its throughput, and latency all are impacted. Uh, so we actually can uh, use core scheduling uh, to separate LAN AVX and the AVX uh, easily. We just need to uh, then a magic number uh, to the core cookie of all AVX tasks. And that's it. And we uh, verify that it, it, it works. Um, the best case, we saw a 10% throughput improvement and 30% uh, latency reduce. Uh, that, that, that is good. Uh, but we're not sure uh, if we it can, uh, can um, catch our project Sorry. So the, sorry. Yeah. So uh, the latency improvements and the throughput you measure, is that for the non-AVX part or the AVX part? Of course, the non-AVX part. The non-AVX part? Yeah. I'm Have you looked into what happens to the AVX part when you schedule them on the same core? Uh, we didn't look at, at AVX part because the frequency is fixed, so. Yeah, but if they end up sharing resources, they might be stepping on each other's foot and being slower because uh, you, you schedule the, them you together. You actually mean the, the resource contention, right? Yeah. Okay, I got it. It's, it's not a problem for me. Uh, be, because those uh, deep learning training tasks are uh, long-term and uh, low priority, yeah. so we actually don't care about that. We just yeah. let them run to e yeah, to, to make use of uh, CPU cycles instead of force idle uh, in core scaling. I mean, the problem is that you're all looking at your particular favorite use case. Yeah. The thing what I'm missing at all of those things is, and the submissions is, what is happening to the general purpose use case? What is happening on a, on a lightly loaded systems with a lot of single task uh, thing is, what is happening to the AVX uh, workload, which actually cares about AVX performance, because Matthew is completely right, if I put them on the same core, they will suffer, because they share uh, the resource. If I put them on two different cores, then of course the frequency of both cores go goes down, but my AVX throughput goes up. So. Uh, the problem I see with all these things is we, we, we discussed in the, or have discussed in the last half year, whether it's related to the speculation stuff or, or to this kind of things, it's all very, very use case focused and I'm missing the, the big picture. So we don't want to build in mechanisms which just fit one single use case. That's totally bonkers because everybody else will suffer from it and then we can fix the fallout there and we are going to 
create more duct tape and more heuristics to figure out what to do for a particular workload is correct. So I'm not seeing the big picture here. It's all too narrow banded focused on a single thing. Yeah, I, I kind of agree and disagree with that. I guess for this, uh, in this case, you optimize for non -A the non-AVX scenario, but uh, hypothetically, you could optimize to avoid AVX core affinity, so your AVX tax tasks would perform much better. I guess we can possibly solve the same problem or multiple problems using the same solution. You can decide what kind of uh, scheduling you want for your... What is deciding that? User space. User space? What is deciding that? Uh, yeah. yeah, user space. And what's, a, what's the effect if there is no user space decision? There should be user space decision. No, I mean, if you boot a system up and there is nothing configuring that stuff, then it should have a same default, which is not worse than what, it, what we have now. Yes, yeah. If it then starts to do silly bonkers defaults, then uh, I'm going, a lot of people are going to be unhappy, yeah, so including me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so by default, it would be off. Like we, we have the hook starting from the build. It's a config option. And once uh, you have kernel line, command, kernel line parameters to actually enable it or disable it, and even if it's enabled, once a system comes up, if your process are not grouped, meaning they are not tagged or they are not, they are not grouped, then this feature will not be active and the code path will not be taken. What means not grouped? A lot of systems today come up with groups. If you mean group is a C group. Grouping has to be done. No, C groups is there, but you have to specifically enable a file on the C group, which is by okay. default zero. Okay. So, so, so the default is just keep the current state. Exactly, exactly. Okay, I'm fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I, I think uh, cross scaling is, is uh, a good option for us, but uh, I'm not sure if you can catch our uh, project schedule. So uh, I'm still open for other, other options. Hello, my name is Jan Schöner, and you might know me that I published the, the co-scheduling patch set. And in this context, I just want to raise the awareness for all the other use cases that are out there that uh, we might not be able to do with just core scheduling, but where we need to do something more. So on the left-hand side, that's the classical core scheduling that we are currently talking about. So synchronizing the execution of two tasks um, ac across time. but not going beyond um, be beyond core level. That works well enough for, for the L1TF and, and MDS use cases. It also works for the uh, where's Aubrey um, for the uh, for the uh, AVX use case. But it, for example, it stops working for other resource contention use cases. Uh, if you are not that lucky and have a CPU that uh, or a processor that can control the frequency per core, but only per package, then uh, you would still need something like this, but you basically want to scratch out core and write socket there so that you can actually um, pair all the uh, AVX tasks um, or unimportant tasks across all CPUs so that you can, uh, for example, get higher turbo boost frequencies for those tasks you actually care about. Um, and on the other hand, uh, on, on the right-hand side, uh, is a different example which uh, basically represents all kind of parallel applications where you kind of have some, some optimization, for example, at SMT level. Uh, so in that case, you don't really need the isolation property, uh, at least not across the, um, the, the outer level, but you might still want to have the isolation property on the SMT level. Uh, and... Um, that's basically it. So there are use cases around it. And if we go the long way of integrating a new scheduling mechanism for, for something, for core scheduling, for core scheduling, uh, I think we should go the long route and kind of making it a little bit more versatile. And that's the point that I want to get across.
So uh, um, regarding that, uh, have you think about using just a CPU set to group the tasks into a certain set of CPU? So CPU sets work uh, until uh, work well until as, as long as your system is not overcommitted. As soon as you get into a more overcommitted scenario, CPU sets stop working because they don't give you the the, the simultaneousness guarantee if you have more load on, on the same uh, core CPU system. Yeah, but even with CPU set, you can have two CPU set, but they share some of the CPU, so you can configure it this way. It don't need to be exclusive. But this doesn't give you coordination across different CPUs. Uh, I might be missing the point. Uh, so you want them to run together, yes. You need some kind of co-scheduling implementation. Yeah. I have one question that I haven't seen in this morning presentation is how you ensure the fairness of all the group with the co-scheduling? Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, c can you come again? Uh, yeah. Uh, how you 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 ensure because you are forcing um, a task from the same group to be scheduled so simultaneously. So how you, do you ensure that a group of tasks will not get more runtime than the other one? So how how the algorithm works is. Yeah. Um, on a on a per run queue basis, you have it sorted. Like you know which process to run next, so you you pick that, and um, basically you try to take the process with the highest priority or which has been starved most. If it's a vrun vrun time based, so you you have a core wide view now. Take the process with the highest priority and then tries to match it. But then the system progresses, vrun time changes, and the the process that needs more runtime it it'll be fair automatically. So you you get a group running, so the other other groups will be waiting, and its VRAN time is smaller now. So next schedule will automatically pick that. So it, it's basically CFS itself when you are talking about fair cut class, CFS itself. But uh, when you try to run uh, a group, you try to make sure that one of the siblings in that one of the uh, task in that group is the highest priority task. Say you have uh, two CPUs mm -hmm. and you pick uh, the highest priority one on the, on the core whole zero. Core. Okay, so this is per per core. Okay. Per core, yeah. That's why we need to have a per core knowledge about uh, which task has the most priority. All right. So so you you consider both the run queues and see which one has the highest priority in both the run queues, and mm -hmm. then pick a sibling for that. Okay, but what if? Uh, I'm not sure if it can happen, but what if the, the process you're looking for, so the, the corresponding that has the same uh, cookies and on, on running on another core? Can, can that happen? I mean, you have, let's say, four CPUs, two core, uh -huh. and uh, you pick uh, I don't know, core zero, uh, the highest priority, but then the corresponding one that you would want to put on the other sibling or cores or the first core is actually running. The core. other core? Yeah. Yeah, as of now, it can happen. And in that case, what happens is this particular core will run one thread with a cookie and the other one will be forced idle mm -hmm. because it doesn't know about the other core okay. yet. Okay. But there is a load balancing logic also which okay. kicks in and tries to pull it. Okay. So it tries so it's to balance. To, to be seen. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, just a quick point. Just a quick point. Um, the way people are using core is not very clear when you're talking about cores, is it like literally one core or are you talking about a bunch of um, SMB cores as one core. To me, a core is literally just one CPU, so I'm kind of confused when you gave the answer to him. So core is consists of uh, uh, SMTs, like hyperthreads. Okay. So a socket has, so, so the ideology to make, make, make um, bring everybody on the same page, a socket can have multiple cores, and a core can have multiple hyperthreads. That's, okay. that's so in this that. case, you're just talking about between the hyperthreads. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so the the idea that we are trying to solve is the security problem because of hyperthreads. There you go. There you go. Uh, all right. What what I'm what I'm actually really curious on. Um, I'm not sure if this, this conversation right now is is actually getting us anywhere. Um, what I'm really curious on is we we've been having um, co and call scheduling discussions for what two years now. 
Um, and I, as far as I know, nothing is upstream, right? We, yes. we don't, we don't, like, we have millions of systems out there running some kind of homegrown cold, cold scheduling systems, um, but not we as in, as in Linux users in general, um, but all of that is downstream code, um, which is a terrible situation to be in. It's not what, where we want to be. So what is keeping us from actually just having a solution? Exactly. So the, the whole point of this MC was actually trying to, uh, trying to come up with uh, uh, ideas about how to actually main, mainstream it, uh, mainline it. And what is keeping us from uh, uh, pushing it to mainline is, uh, is a difference in ideology. Like, um, so MDS and L1TF in picture, MDS, uh, we, we can have two threads on, on the same core uh, attacking each other or a thread can in the user line can attack the kernel. And this uh, specific core scheduling feature cannot mitigate that. So core scheduling tries to make sure that trusted tasks can execute at the same time on the core. But what if you have two trusted tasks running and one task goes into kernel, either be a syscall or a VM exit or an interrupt. Now you have one task and one kernel running. And this task cannot be trusted with respect to the kernel. So that has been the whole topic, uh, which is preventing, um, uh, like, uh, uh, going to main lane. So we are trying to see what can be the solutions now. Where, where, I can scroll over. Uh, can you turn around and just wave so I know? Okay. So uh, there is a separate patch set, uh, the address space isolation, uh, floating around for that, but. Uh, from what I read from that email thread, <laughs> it's not too rosy. Even there, uh, I think Thomas had some comments uh, on that. So yeah, but we need both to fully secure. So <laughs> on the core scheduling versus co scheduling. On the core scheduling versus co scheduling thing, it seems like the co scheduling is a lot more complicated. And I have not seen any benchmark results yet. Maybe I just missed them, but I have not seen any that justify the extra, extra complexity. Uh, the, I, I don't think I posted updated ones. Uh, I have some, some very old ones. Um, you're probably not interested in those. It's more complicated in. in, in I don't know if it's more complicated. It's maybe more complicated on a code level, but not on a conceptual level, I think. <laughs> because, uh, for example, the, the decision which task to pick, I think you, you do it kind of kind of online and, and, and have to compare actually all, all, the, all the queues. In my approach, that data is already aggregated in, in a run queue, in that case, for a core. So there's a core global run queue, which basically executes pairs of tasks or has pairs of tasks, simply speaking. And there you don't have the issue of deciding which task do I need to pull next. I, I just take the one that's first in the run queue, and that's it. There the logic is more kind of in, in a, how do I aggregate the, the priorities upwards. Now from a security perspective, I guess if the mitigation is uh, turning off hyper-threading, then the comparison has to be against that. Um, yeah, the, the security problems are the same. So, I mean, at the lower end where you're not oversubscribed, yes, turning off hyper-threading is better. But as you start getting oversubscribed, at that point in time, the benefits are starting to skew towards core scheduling. Yeah, well, that's not what I asked, though. Sorry? I was wondering between the two, is the extra complexity of a more complicated thing justified versus a simpler thing? Okay, I'm sorry. And this we need to figure out which, what code do we want to maintain for the next decade or so. For core scheduling specifically, we have done the, the performance benchmarks, and all of them are posted on the, the thread. But basically, if you use the CPU, core scheduling makes sense. If you are I.O. bound, that we really don't care. But the, um, it's about 40% idle. If you go lower than 40% idle, then you can see the shift between no SMT being useful and uh, having less impact than core scheduling. But it's really just pure CPU power, that's it. Maybe one addition. Um, 
So for, for the, the what, what you said, more complex solution, the overhead is basically similar to, to the currently still nested C groups. So uh, one hierarchy level is equivalent to one, uh, one, one nested C group. Um, but as long as you don't make use of the, the co-scheduling feature, uh, there you should be able to avoid this overhead completely. I'm actually working on ripping out the hierarchy, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, like in favor of course scheduling, um, like that, th what what we think is um, agreed. Like it doesn't fix all the problems. Um, uh, still, there is vulnerability when a user task is running with the kernel task. But there are there are use cases like for 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 bench for uh, workloads that needs this. Basically, there are use cases where it can make use of it and and be very secure. So. Um, so with with with, lo with the mitigation options exactly in place, uh, I think it would be better to have core scheduling mainlined so that people who wants to use can use it. Um, but by default, it's turned off. Um, for example, VM-like workloads uh, for L1TF, uh, you need the 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 privilege boundary is basically on VM exits, and we don't like on a, on an ideal theoretical case, VM, there are not much VM exits unless you are not configured correctly. And for MDS, um, for VM in virtualization workloads, I think VM exits is the only privilege boundary because uh, you have uh, VMs running, and you don't have user land processes which tries to tries to leak information from the kernel. So, um, l like this, there are specific use cases which can make use of it. You have the same problem with L1TF. Once one one sibling goes out of the guest into the c into the host, then it will <coughs> uh, it will fill up the L1, which is shared with host data, which then the the guest the other sibling, which in a malicious way can expose. It's not. Y yes, but it's but not. It's hard, but it's actually an insane fast, so it's very efficient, so you can do it. Ex yeah, but but we need to take care of the VM exit condition. So VM exit is like a privilege boundary which ne which we need to take care of. But if we can take care of the VM exit privilege boundary, like if we can make sure that on a VM exit you don't run an untrusted task on the on the sibling, then we are safe, right? Yeah, but but if you run two if you do the group thingy, mm -hmm. this grouping thingy, and you have two untrusted uh, mm -hmm. uh, guest vCPUs running on that core, mm -hmm. once one goes out, you have to kick the other out as well. Yes. So the VM exit is the boundary that we are planning to kick out the other one. And it's and it's bas you basically have the same problem on on uh, on the on the uh, on the host side for the syscalls, interrupts, and everything else. But on a that's correct, but but what I'm trying to say is on a on a virtualization workload, if you just take care of VM exit, you don't need to take care of syscalls and interrupts. Uh, you just need to take care of the VM exit because uh, if if you put a security boundary there, no, it's the same because from from the kernel's point of view, you either go into user space via sys exit, or you go into user space via VM enter. It's the same thing from a kernel point of view you're just going out into a different <coughs> into a different domain yeah and but both are untrusted and I don't care which one is tr is more trusted or less trusted both are untrusted and the boundary is either you go out to user space or you go into a VM but the returning from them by any means what is is either a VM exit or uh, a syscall or an interrupt from which hits user space, then you have the same situation that you have one in the kernel boundary and one in the underrested boundary. So it's it's not any different. 
you, you are right, but VM exit is the first thing that happens when a CPU comes out, like a vCPU comes out, comes out to the kernel or the user, right? VM exit is the first thing that happens. So no, you no, you have either, when you're talking about guests, you have VM exit. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about malicious code running exactly. on the host, you have syscall or interrupt you're or right. an exception. You're right, you're right. So, so I was telling you about a specific use case of virtualization. So, so my, my point... Yeah, the, you're back to that point where I was criticizing before. Don't stop at your specific use case. Look at the full picture. And it's exactly the same problem. It doesn't matter how you paint it. Whether it's called VM exit or it's called sysenter, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing from the security point of view. I so am... You so forget about the the mechanism. Mm -hmm. Talk about the concept. That the concept is one thread moves into a different security domain. And then you have to act on the other thread in some way or the other. That's the whole point. And you have to do it for all the mechanisms we have, of course. And that's where things get really interesting. Yeah. So if, if we consider all these cases like syscalls, VM exits, uh, all these cases, then the fix would be like, uh, it would be, it would, considering the no SMT case, it would be the performance would be much, much worse. I, I agree, I agree with that. Yeah, sure, but you have to do it. Otherwise, it's a half solution. Uh, if I may, just one thing. Uh, I mean, it seems to, uh, be, there seems to be a lot of discussion between, uh, is it black or white, right? So what I'm wondering is whether you can use internal kernel statistics information to differentiate between a uh, user space CPU intensive uh, task and a task that is going back and forth between security domains very often. So that task going back and forth would not benefit from doing core scheduling uh, if it wants to miti mitigate of the MDS. Not. It's the same problem for, for, for guests who do uh, you do a lot of VM exits. We I we have the numbers already. It becomes insane slow. Yeah, but it, those should be used to figure out uh, where it makes sense to use core scheduling for <coughs> specific tasks. Yeah, yeah, but still you have to have the. We it have doesn't it? Do, but that doesn't that doesn't make the underlying requirement go away, which says if one transitions into the kernel then you have to act upon the other. So, and whether that's frequent or whether you disable it if it's frequent or not, that's a totally different playground. That plays into the performance thing. The other is a correctness thing and do not conflate them. You, you need, you need the, the, mecha the pr protection mechanism in any case. Mm -hmm. And if you decide it's too heavy for that workload and I just, isolate that on a, on a single core forever and basically disable is SMT on that core by software means without disabling it actually, then this is a just a that's policy a, thing. It's absolutely right and that's why the core scheduling feature is really flexible. You, we saw the AVX case, we see the VM only workloads where we only run untrusted code and the kernel is considered, the host is considered safe. That's the whole point, is that we can configure it however we want. It's not yeah, but a one. Do you have, do you have the all the transition cases mitigated we, we by We now? need them, we need them, that's, of course we need them. No, we th the question was, they, they are not there yet, right? No, they're not there. Yeah. Uh, right now we have only user space to user space. I, I that's I the only one, but we want to add them and then we will have the flexibility to look at how we want to configure, because you're absolutely right, we need a way to express, and only the administrator knows their workload. So uh, that's absolutely in right. So I, I think the thing to remember is like, this isn't only a scheduler problem, right? <laughs> Handling the syscall marks and synchronizing on kernel entry exit isn't something we can do in the scheduler. So oh. full mitigation is going to consist of something that does that and co-scheduling. Right. Uh, you, you could imagine that in the case that like, in our problem case where something is causing lots of exits and is causing lots of interference, that we give it its own tag so that we don't co-schedule, we don't, co that we schedule that on its own core without actually needing to turn off SMT, right? That would be an optimization we can make. But I do think you need to do something like 
um, the address space isolation trick so that we don't need to do it on every syscall and we don't need to do it on every VM exit. But that's kind of a separate piece from the scheduler. So I think we need to be able to talk about the pieces separately and talk about how we can assemble them into a mitigation as the set. But like certainly it won't be one size fits all and like the scheduler stuff won't handle the syscall case. No, the scheduler won't handle the syscall exactly. thing, but but you have to think hard about it. Oh, yeah, what, yeah. what is going? What are we going to do with the Cisco thing? Yes, I mean, I, I would it say will add, because it will inevitably end up in the scheduler again. So I 100% agree with you. I would say, like, what what you're saying is missing from this slide deck is the picture of here are the three pieces we need, and here are, here's how they fit together. And I think that's a totally fair statement, but it also doesn't. It doesn't mean we can't talk about like, okay, like pretend we have those other two pieces that we know we need. What is what do we need for this other piece? Right? No, no, no. I, I, I don't say that we have to delay core scheduling per se by, yeah, we, because we, we don't have the other pieces. We have but, to have the picture. But we have to have the picture yeah. right now in order to get it s straight, because other, otherwise, when we yeah. add the other pieces. We start over and uh, rip out the uh, half of the code and replace it again, and that's what I want to I avoid. I, I completely yeah. agree with you. I, I think the major discussion there is actually not on the scheduler side, but if we can come to some consensus on the address space isolation side, right. so I, which I, has I, its own set of it, problems. I, you know, <laughs> I agree. I'm just saying, like, I think <laughs> like we can define what the scheduler side of the picture looks like. We haven't defined the other side. That is a take at doing it. We need to either agree on doing it that way or like reject it and do something else. But that like the scheduler side is more defined than the other side. Yeah, um, I agree with that. So yeah. are you saying that uh, for like low switch cases, uh, core scheduling plus ASI will still beat uh, HD disable? So yes. just keep that because on the for whole those point cases. Of the whole point of ASI, like the uh, address space isolation is we don't need to stunt. Right? We don't need to start on typical VM exits. We don't need to start on typical syscalls, okay. which means that the performance numbers we have are the actual performance numbers for, for mitigation. Now, that's a priori, assuming we fill in the other side of the picture with address space isolation. We mm -hmm. haven't, like, so I, I agree with Thomas that we need to put the whole picture and we need to agree with in that. We don't need to implement it, but we need to figure out the discussion on the other side of the picture. Once we have that, we could actually talk about you know, this saying, oh, we know we're going to lean on that for the other parts, but that's what's complicating some of the discussion. Okay. So we need the picture in order to see what needs to, what it's, what might be missing on the scheduler side, which we need to make the other parts work. Yeah. And before we, before we shove something in, which we have to redo yeah. hopefully a year later again. No, I, I completely agree on that point. Sorry, but we are running out of time for this topic. So we have to move to the next one, but uh, we can easily continue the discussion and all the way just after. Yeah. Okay, so moving on. Um, Yuri Lelli, uh, working for Red Hat in the real time uh, team. And. Um, so uh, lately I've been uh, uh, working on this uh, proxy execution idea, uh, uh, basically working on uh, patches from Peter and try to, uh, to see if we can get the m that main line. So why we need that? Uh, quick introduction, just five minutes and we have 15 minutes to discuss this. So um, hopefully everybody here is uh, uh, really familiar with the priority as a mechanism and how is it solved. Uh, just, uh, here you have a simple example. So usually the standard example is uh, three tasks on the same CPU, uh, low priority one, high priority one, and the middle priority one. The low and high share some resources which are protected by a mutex, an RT mutex in this case, so it's uh, priority inheritance uh, enabled. And uh, the trick is that uh, when this task uh, blocks, uh, so this task actually uh, lock the mutex, and then uh, is preempted by the highest priority one. But then uh, when the highest priority one tries to block, tries to acquire the same lutex, he blocks on it, and he, he inherits the priority of the, uh, so this guy will inherit the highest priority one, 
and will basically continue executing even if a medium priority uh, task uh, it uh, wakes up. Without that, basically, this guy, which has nothing to do with the other two, can actually preempt the lower priority one and can uh, indefinitely take uh, uh, the processor uh, from the higher priority one, creating all sorts of problems. So um, currently in Linux, uh, this is uh, this problem is uh, solved for, uh, for example, for FIFO uh, using uh, basically inheriting the priority. So you just copy the priority uh, of uh, this guy to into this guy task thread, and then use that priority when deciding between these two tasks, which one to pick. Uh, for SCAD deadline, we have uh, something which looks similar, but is uh, kind of uh, broken, just because uh, basically the priority for deadline, the SCAD deadline uh, uh, scheduling uh, class is represented by the dynamic deadline, which, uh, well, it's dynamic, so it always changes, and uh, it uh, basically lacks the notion of inheriting the bandwidth, so deadline has this notion of runtime over deadline, so it's uh, actually a it's a percentage of CPU time that is granted to, to tasks. And we currently don't inherit that thing. Uh, and this also prohibits us to make SCAD deadline uh, available for not root usage, just because that is, uh, can actually open the, the door to other kind of problems. So the idea would be to uh, start actually inheriting more than single values, but actually properties of tasks. And uh, for example, uh, for deadline, uh, if you apply the same uh, thing for, for deadline, uh, this guy here, so the lower priority one, the lowest priority one, would actually uh, inherit the full properties of the highest one, in this case, the, the bandwidth. So it will actually consume the bandwidth of, the, of this guy when this guy blocks. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so this is basically what I want to discuss. I guess uh, two, two main ideas, um, if you want to have a better understanding of how is this is implemented. Uh, I guess first thing is that we divide uh, the notion of a scheduling context, which are the, the, really the properties, the scheduling property of a task, which can be a, the priority, can be the runtime of a period. Um, and uh, the, the donors can actually uh, donate those priorities. And I guess the other big uh, difference uh, for, uh, res with respect to how the RT mutexes uh, work today is that uh, when, uh, in for example, in this case, this guy blocks uh, on, the other, on the other guy, it, it is not actually uh, removed from the rank queue. So we keep it on the rank queue, we just uh, uh, say, okay, this guy is blocked on this other guy, and then we let basically the, the scheduler run. And if this guy is actually picked up by the scheduler because it's still the highest priority one, then we basically uh, um, construct the donor uh, uh, chain. Uh, so we basically uh, go there and see which uh, guys are blocked on this mutex. And then uh, we can actually know which is the highest priority one from which we, we want to inherit. So um, I think uh, since uh, we uh, basically have only 10 minutes, uh, we've been discussing this uh, since uh, last year. So I managed to basically post the first version last year. And uh, um, unfortunately, I kind of uh, post an, a newer version. I rebased the set. I'm uh, basically working on it uh, currently. Uh, there are still a few issues. So I, as soon as I get it like uh, a little bit more stable, I post a new version. But uh, uh, we discuss uh, this thing uh, in May. Uh, in May, in PISA, we have this small, let's say, scheduler and power uh, power management conference, and uh, there were a few guys that are already here and been discussing uh, if this makes sense or what are the problems around this. And uh, my uh, take from that discussion was that the biggest problem that we have is uh, how do we handle the fact that. Uh, uh, the lock owner and uh, the uh, other task that blocks on the same lock can actually be running on different CPUs. So SMP is actually kind of tricky to, to handle. The current solution um, is to uh, basically migrate uh, all the tasks that are actually uh, blocked on the mutex on the uh, owner CPU 
and then let the scheduler run on the owner CPU, select the highest priority one, which uh, might, I mean, at the point, it will, will be actually uh, be the highest priority task block on the mutex, and then use the mechanism. So this, uh, this works uh, if you uh, don't have uh, affinities, of course, for tasks. Even if we ignore affinities, since we are basically interested in uh, the scheduling properties more than uh, what the task is actually doing, uh, there might be a problem for admission control for deadline because uh, you can basically be breaking uh, your calculation. So uh, when you admit the task, then if the task migrates and the bandwidth contribution, the task wasn't accounted for in the destination CPU, then you might break uh, guarantees for the others. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, so the answer basically from uh, the discussion that we had there was, uh, yeah, we cannot really do this because it will break uh, 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 admission control. So that's, yeah, so um, let's see, yeah, so I continue thinking about it and, uh, and actually I realized that uh, so currently, admission control, we perform that uh, at uh, root domain level. So let's say, but we don't actually enforce uh, that uh, every CPU has uh, its own uh, bandwidth allocation. So uh, if I have four CPUs and they have 50% uh, of uh, available bandwidth each, I'm not putting actually 50% and I'm checking that 50% when I migrate tasks. I just migrate tasks considering deadlines. So I can already be put in, let's say, 100% of band or one CPU just because there, there are two tasks running at 50. So in this case, if everything, I mean, if the, if the mutex thing uh, actually happened inside the root domain, I guess, I think we're actually safe. That was my... Yeah, so um, I would say for mission control for slightly later first get the the thing to actually work yeah. um but yeah the the problem is the the shared resource a lot of the admission control theory does not have that term in yeah yeah i mean i, I agree that first we need to make this yeah. work but uh, my problem is that uh, if we go and say okay migrating the uh the tasks that are waiting so the potential donors to the cpu w is going to be working uh I mean, the, the decision that's uh, how it's going to implement it. If then we found out that that's not actually working, we have to basically but change everything, right? But so it is the only possible option. Um, there isn't anything much else. It's the it's same like in this uh, schedulability theory. A lot of the um, shared resources are ignored. Um, I mean, um, as soon as you put actual logs in, uh, a lot of the workloads are non-schedulable by by all the algorithms proposed yeah. Um, yeah it was actually actually my yeah sorry and my question here is is it is this a practical problem or is it a theoretical problem uh, it's actually both because basically the simplest and maybe the only thing we can actually implement and do is to migrate the the task that are blocked on the uh, lock owner cpu and let them run there so right. that's, that's what already what yeah. is already yeah, implemented. Yeah, but, but this is a transitional state, right? It's not a permanent state. It's uh, a transitional state up to the point where the task, where the lock drops. Yeah, that is true. But then, uh, if you're you're basically using the bandwidth of uh, tasks that were on different on other CPUs, and there you're migrating that thing on the CPU where the lock owner is running. I if know. there are like uh, other tasks that are running and consuming bandwidth, and you are basically oversubscribing temporarily the team, but yes, that might generate problems. Yeah, right? the, but the question is, is that temporal oversubscription really really hurting anyone? Because it's going away immediately after the lock is dropped. And for that time where you have those those scheduling properties moved over onto the other run queue where the lock owner sits and is a fine tune and you cannot move it away. Mm -hmm. uh, then you can mark those not contributing to the overall accounting temporarily, so your 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 admission control math won't 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 go out the window for that mm. for that period. Also, 
because that's your main concern here. Yeah, also, um, the next time it might move some bandwidth to the other CPU, so statistically it would then yeah, that, still that, that, That's basically the same point that I actually uh, had after the discussion we had in PISA, because uh, as I said, if the task, I mean, if both the lock owner and the task that blocks on the mutex are were already admitted in a root domain, that means that their respective bandwidth was already admitted to the system. So if they're scheduled on different CPUs or, or on the same, it doesn't matter because we don't actually check currently where they're actually scheduled. The problem raises if they're actually coming from different root domains. So if the, the affinities, let's say, don't, don't, don't overlap. But then again, if they don't overlap and then they actually share resources, that's maybe a design issue, right? So yeah, that, that's basically, a, I wanted to discuss this because uh, if we say, okay, that's not a problem and we can go ahead with what's implemented right now, it, well, it's simpler because it's already there, we just make it uh, yeah, work. But yeah, we'll have to. I mean, um, the kernel is always a global resource, so the, the whole um, multiple root domain is, is always an idealized situation anyway. Um, and we'll, we'll just have to live with a wee bit of violation there. Yeah. There's nothing much. I mean, don't trigger proxy will get you inversions. So yeah, right, yeah, that, that, that's worse. Yeah. Problem. Yeah, so <laughs> I suppose just really quick. So you're saying to migrate over during the uh, scheduling time. What's the added overhead in that migration? I mean, isn't, if it matters, if the lock's not held that long, wouldn't just moving the tasks back and forth it, it's not about well. the overhead, it's about the injected um, right. bandwidth that uh, AC hasn't well, accounted for. But overhead will add injection bandwidth to it. So the question is, is it that, oh, can that overhead cause, have you done tests to see? Uh, not yet. Uh, I guess that uh, will probably be the next step. I mean, once this thing is actually, let's say, stable, then we will we'll have to test this. Uh, on the other hand, we, if we don't migrate, uh, I guess it creates uh, probably more trouble because what we do with the task that is not migrated and is so running so on the CPU. So you have to migrate because if your dependency chain spans CPUs, you can end up in the situation where you want to run the same task multiple times. And th this is bad. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any way to tag uh, the tasks, uh, uh, the locks, sorry, uh, and associate them with specific domains? So you would do proxy execution only within one domain, and that would be restrained to this. No, you want to always do it. Well. A anyway, yeah, we're running out of time. So since, uh, yeah, I was expecting not to finish the discussion <laughs> in these 10 minutes because it's uh, quite a tricky one. I guess we can continue. I mean, uh, we have three days, so yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I'm taking a little bit different uh, aspect of making scheduling deadlines safe, uh, rather than like that. Is that better? How about that? <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, making scheduling safe, but instead of making it safe for admission policies or inversions or whatever uh, for kernel tracks. I have one of these around here somewhere. How about that one? Is that right? Yeah. So uh, how many people uh, saw the thread uh, where Dimitri was uh, doing some fuzz testing on kernel's tasks and uh, just uh, totally uh, got RCA, yeah, a couple of people? I'm sorry? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we got RCU CPU stall warnings. You know, if you want to look, the slides will be up at some point, and there's the URL for it. Uh, and uh, uh, Ted Cho well, looked at it and says, well, you know, when you send your, set your uh, scheduling cycle, I, I've used the wrong word, I'm sorry, uh, to uh, period, excuse me, to 26 days, uh, you have to expect some breakage. 126 years. years. Okay, 26 days of CPU time. I'm sorry, I'm not reading my own slide even. Uh, anyway, so I was uh, my automatic thing. If somebody gets an RCCP stall warning and it's not something totally broken, is hey, put some con reskeds in somewhere and that'll help. And and that totally didn't do anything in this case at all. Uh, but the question is, what should we be doing instead? Um, I mean. In this case, yeah, 146 years, um, you could end up waiting 146 years, but if you have a CPU-bound task, you're going to wait 26 days. And that's a long time, and not just for RCU. So, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, so we, um, 
I actually proposed a patch, and we're now in the third revision because simple things can be difficult too. <laughs> um, that sets simple. limits on period. Mm -hmm. It basically mandates a minimum and a maximum period. What um, are the numbers, if you can tell me? I think it's like one milli versus four seconds. One milli versus four seconds. Uh, one milli, uh, I'm, I'm not too worried about it being too short. That's not my problem, although it's probably yours. So, yeah. Um, uh, four seconds is, a I'm a little bit nervous about that. I'd feel better with one, but. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I have to pick a number. I, I uh, thought, like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that no matter what number you pick, somebody's going to be torqued off. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah. Well, it's actually Yuri, not Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was saying that uh, four seconds is basically the granularity of the thing. Mm -hmm. Basically, every four seconds, there will be 5% of those four seconds available to. Okay. Oh. Yeah. There's a base of reality number four, Clark said. Now yeah. The thing, though. It wasn't just picked no, out of the it sky. It was actually two to the power of 32. Because that's a really nice number. What was the units on that? Uh, nanos. Oh, okay. Well, that, that might be reasonable. Uh, okay, so uh, what what does this imply? I mean, so you got this patch. You have a, a limit of one millisecond on the low end, four seconds on the high end for the period. Yeah. Okay. Um, does and and so no matter what you did, you'd have that period there. And that means that your um, uh, that your uh, quantity of time would have to be four seconds or less, presumably, or it would reject you. Yeah. So so that specific configuration will be rejected. Okay. Because that's 146 nice, years is we bit over four seconds. La last I checked. Um, of course, it depends on what uh, object you're using to compute years. But yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there aren't too many that have millisecond uh, revolution rates, but there's probably some astronaut bodies out there <laughs> somewhere. Uh, anyway, uh, so so in other words, if you did set it to four seconds, the biggest time you can specify is four seconds. Yeah, the, the biggest period was four yeah. seconds. No, no, not just period, running. but the number, the biggest uh, amount time. of time. Yeah, so so we have like a ninety-five percent yeah. rule in there somewhere. So you cannot get more than 95% of four seconds. Okay, so no more than uh, 3.8 seconds. Something like that, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, is, is there, so the additional uh, 0.2 seconds per four seconds, that's available to anybody or to uh, lower scheduling classes? Is SCED FIFO different than SCED other in this uh, thing, or how's that work? Uh, give, them, give them the mic. Yeah, the, the other, the, the other, the, uh, yeah, so the the, you were right. <laughs> I'm gonna hear about the other it's, thing. Uh, yeah, that's available for for other guys. But I, I think uh, well, I think that that basically solved this particular issue. But uh, what uh, Peter uh, Farter proposed is to actually use deadline to schedule uh, lower priority classes for mm -hmm. let's say five percent of the time. Right. Okay, so let me interrupt you and yeah. ask a stupid question. Uh, so I was uncomfortable for seconds. Does this mean I could say? the RCU grace period K thread and it, its kernel threads need a deadline of one second instead of four seconds, would that work? I mean, I could change the number. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. No, that wasn't what I was asking, Peter. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, a configuration I mean, thing, yes. Uh, I mean, so what I'm, what I'm asking is uh, do different, uh, uh, Paul's looking a little nervous, so maybe the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> give him the mic. Excellent give Paul question. the mic. Uh, the, uh, I could ask the question, I suppose, but that'd let be me, too let easy. Let me ask you a question. I don't think the uh, the RCU threads in the sched, uh, is in the sched deadline scheduler class, is it? No. It's not now, no. but it sounds like they're having some kind of a thing that give that guarantees the aggregate rest of the system some amount of time every four seconds. Yeah, but that could be given to another thread. It could. And then you yeah. get the thing the four seconds after that or whatever it is, so that period ends up actually being totally arbitrary even if you make the period smaller. Right, I, I I got that. I mean, I mean, one one reaction I could take would be to, uh, um, under certain circumstances, or always take the RCU grace period K threads and get deadline them. Um, now, if I was, to uh, go ahead. So yeah, uh, well yeah, let, let's <laughs> say that uh, all these is similar to the current uh, RT throttling pin. So mm -hmm. if you have, uh, there is a, a safety mechanism which, mm, I mean, 
mean by default you have five percent of time Never devoted? Yeah. You can still you can still yeah. charge the same as CPU. Yeah. 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 You can do what to the CPU? No, no what 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 he said is that as we have a global scheduler, we can have uh, we we try to ensure that we use only ninety five percent of CPU. But as we have two CPUs, we can run 100% in, in one, and uh, the rest on the other. can be even need idle in the other. And you create some intense. Uh, so it could be kind of tough yeah. for K software IoT running soft RCU software IoT, for example, yeah. or if real time the RCU C uh, per CPU kernel threads so might so not for, like this. For real time, we, we killed that. Um, I thought we did from mainline as well, but I forgot. Um, killed what, exactly? The, the sharing of the runtime. So oh, okay. um, make it 95% uh, per CPU. Mm -hmm. No sharing. Okay, that would be easier from a kernel thread so viewpoint. Actually, uh, give, the, give them the mic, or throw the other mic over here so I'm gonna pass them back and forth unless somebody else wants one. So basically the idea, w what you implemented, and yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically what you have is that uh, then you'll have one the deadline schedule entry for CPU, and that thing will have basically 5% of CPU time over, let's say, four seconds, right? The, the server or? Which the server thing. Yeah, so, so that's that's another thing. Um, yeah. I also um, prototyped a, a deadline server, mm -hmm. and this will run CFS as a deadline task. So okay. every five percent by mm -hmm. default um, of the uh, maximum period, we will we'll force run CFS tasks irrespective of any available real time or uh, deadline tasks. Because I mean, it will be a deadline task. I but I have a question for this point. So, in in your implementation, are you moving all the tasks to the server or not? Uh, excuse me, you guys have to share a mic because somebody else wants one. There we are. Sorry. No, I, just it. Yeah, I'm gonna it. I offered to throw. I offered to throw this one, but they said that wasn't safe. Uh, okay. Peter, <laughs> Peter, that server can that be configured? Uh, currently, no. This is why they have RFC on. Uh, it was a really crude hack, but it, it, it should be configurable. Yeah, so, so we could actually say when the system starts, we give that 10% every second or something sure. like that. And and then everything else which comes in and does a deadline can in belief with that. I mean, correct. You, you just have to make sure that it finally meets the deadline, right? Yeah. But the question it's task increased. selection, it just takes from the regular C++ queue. Right. So the, the problem is you can still indefinitely postpone the RC. Even even with the even with a bandwidth server, you can still indefinitely postpone the RCU thread. You need to have a per CPU. It, you unless you, you move the. So it's actually better. No, no, but unless you move the RCU thread into deadline. That's automatically done because you have to keep the runtime process. No, no, but I'm saying you can have arbitrary other CFS threads oh, yeah, in yeah, front yeah. of it. But that's a <laughs> But that's a problem for Paul. No, but but if but but there is a that there is something to think. If you move all your tasks to a deadline server that runs in the deadline run queue, you don't get the five percent. No, it's it's not even the, the five percent. Is that you you translate your today? It's implicitly we we don't have these in a scheduler, but. Our schedulers are fixed, are scheduled in a fixed priority, right? As if it was, uh, because we first try to schedule deadline, then schedule FIFO, then schedule uh, other. If you move schedule other tasks inside a container, you put the penalty in the, in the FIFO scheduler. Sure, but we can add another. Peter. Yeah, but if you add another, we will miss the property of knowing that uh, the, FIFO thread, the highest priority FIFO thread, if it's alone with other tasks, if it's alone, it will not necessarily be the highest priority thread. Because at that time, the, the time of the race, the SCAD uh, server that is uh, running the SCAD other tasks might have a higher priority because of a shorter deadline. Correct. And so we will not have the property of having the SCAD FIFO over the SCAD other always. And that's the vast majority of your users, users right now. So this is something. So it, it, that, that goes with what Thomas asked. Uh, is that thing configurable? Mm. Currently, so no, because it's just a few hard-coded lines of C. But yeah, we should put knobs on. And, and, and then I will bring a question from Luca. Luca was Luca Beni. 
he was looking at this configuration. Oh, you should be you. <laughs> and uh, just just let me finish. Me. And uh, his original idea included a C group interface for it. Isn't yeah, but isn't uh, to be that thing disabled by default? You need to have a way to configure. How would you configure this in runtime? What would well, be what, what I would do? Uh, just this is kind of the uh, thing. Oh yeah, so go ahead, go ahead, Matthew. Uh, just uh, out of curiosity, uh, if you take uh, let's say five percent of your sked deadline, uh, the uh, deadline, and give it to the kernel, what happens to kernel threads, which are pinned to specific uh, CPUs? When, well, as I understand, the, the concept of deadline is system-wide. So you might be, I guess, having zero time on specific CPUs and loads of time on other CPUs. Ah, so um, the deadline server is strictly per CPU. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, um, Bjorn might have something. For, uh, Bjorn had a paper on Slack scheduling, uh, Slack time scheduling, I think. Yeah. But and th this is close to that. Yeah, but, the, but when you have a Slack, we not we are not uh, we are not scheduling by the deadline, but by the Slack time. This is another scheduler, Slack like ADs as well, Lib Slack of course. These are yeah. other. They are all deadline schedulers, but they are not the EDS schedulers. Yes, I know, but um, these are things to. So so the, this is yeah closest to Slack time, I think. So the, so the. Uh, so what, what it comes down to is my question, my overall question is, can I get away with uh, just leaving my selfie sked other and allowing people to do FIFO priority? Or should I take a di more dynamic approach where I you know, detect the fact that I'm not getting enough CPU and so move to FIFO or move to deadline so or my something? If I, yeah, my, my take on this is that to solve this particular problem, the, the very, the first solution, uh, so imposing limits on mm -hmm. the actual parameters, it's basically working just because okay. yeah, doesn't allow something like this to enter the problem. It doesn't solve all the problems, so uh, of course, and then uh, having what Peter, a uh, second solution, it might actually help, uh, help uh, handling uh, other sort of problems. Okay. And then if you really want your callbacks, for right. example, to be uh, scheduled, uh, if you have also other deadlines or real-time tasks, then maybe one, one thing that can be thought is to use deadline for, for those threads as well. well in, the real, in the real time case, yeah. uh, the priority of the callback indication yeah. is the operator's responsibility, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> unless you do elevation in RCU, all of these changes push out the problem point further and further and further and further, but they don't eliminate it. Right, you, in other words, you have to use, and isn't that default now in RT? It doesn't RT default to RCU priority boosting being on? Or am I? Confused. I think it there's does. Yeah. yeah, there's a config option. There's no, there is a config option, but I thought that RT recently switched it, so by default, an RT yeah, is it on. Might, it might be time to just flip that. Um, so uh, I just want to bring up a point that uh, we had similar problem with the uh, uh, CPU frag K threads, I think, a few years ago. So I, I feel like this is a similar problem, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm, I'm just like wondering if, if there's some more general mechanism that is needed to solve this. So we're not talking about some other important thread in a few years. Yeah, so for, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for, for, for those threads, actually, the, the, the hack is actually worse than this. Basically, we just, uh, yeah. I mean, they're highest priority, and we don't basically account for them. They just, when, when they have to run, it run. It's like a kind of the, the stopper thread. So it's something that is uh, highest priority than everything. So. At, yeah. at, at PISA, we did have some conversation at a high level about ideas of mixing art like EDF and FAIR for the unscheduled EDF time, which does actually have nice properties for problems like this, but it is, of, it is, a, like, it is not a quick fix. Uh, may, maybe for the future, we need to think about uh, Another way to scheduling, still using deadline, but taking care of per CPU things, and then trying to move like we're the, we're working on partition yeah. Stuff. yeah, yeah. I was working with a yeah. same partition scheduler, <laughs> that's a possibility, right. but we, the, the real, the point now is that we, the current implementations for 
uh, same partition doesn't support the the Luca. Come? Mi manca la, la parola. <laughs> no, no, a Luca bene. Uh, CBS. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So because of the same problems of blocking in the middle of the execution, but uh, I think that a, a, fine, a, a better solution would involve uh, things like same partition and uh, or per CPU control of the, the bandwidth. And, uh, but see, this is a lot of work. So I'd, li I'd like to channel uh, Linus for a moment here. Uh, his next question, I believe, at this point would be, okay, if we do all of this, can uh, config RCU KFRED for I.O. go away? Um, <laughs> but it, it might. Yeah, uh, I think the uh, like fundamental solution uh, is uh, if, if you have some part of the thread non RT and some thread RT is never worked at all. So the very long term solution is actually everybody move to RT. We can uh, <laughs> we have scalability problems, but uh, that may be solvable. There might there was there might uh, it's RT's gotten a lot better on the overhead throughput case than it used to be. Uh, I mean, just the uh, RT including the scat deadline. So it's uh, maybe everybody we should maybe fuse CFS with a scat deadline as conceptually, so we can run uh, uh, everything with like a QoS parameters. Um, um, That's kind of the, the, the cleaner the, solution. The QoS for, uh, I'll, I'll take pity on my core uh, admins that have to configure this. Uh, the QoS for the RCU callback offload threads is a very interesting and strange thing to compute because it depends on the workload. And no, 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 no. It's not, it, it's simpler than that. It's all of the CPU if it needs it. Sure. But like, this is again the comment the same like how far do you want to push it out to the tail? Mm -hmm. So getting some QoS parameter pushes it a very long way out to the tail versus no <coughs> parameter. You need at least two threads for RCU. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll just what we're gonna do. It, there are, there are only a few thousand call RCU instances. What we'll do is we're gonna add make it be boolean, and it'll just tell you no. I'm sorry, you can't call RCU right now. Yeah. We can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's silent. that makes it easier. We won't have to change the API. We just drop it silently. It's the RCU oops in progress. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, anyway, that's, uh, I guess, the two extreme positions. So it sounds like, uh, uh, so going back when I made up the slide, uh, not having paid attention to the discussion, which is my fault, um, it looks like uh, we're doing the first line of defense is making skid set at a reduced reject silly request where silly is now rec uh, defined to uh, as four seconds max and millisecond min. I'm a little nervous about four, but maybe I'm being overly nervous. I and so that's a, that, that, well, it's a, it is a occupational hazard of being RCU maintainer to be overly concerned. So <laughs> possibly a scheduler maintainer might have the same uh, problem. Um, I could make, uh, to some extent, I have the ability to make it defend itself. I give that to the guy building the kernel, or excuse me, the guy booting the kernel with the uh, priority control. So that, but it, that obviously does only helps up to FIFO. It doesn't help with deadline. I could make a thing saying, here's the deadline. Here, tell me what I'll do to do and I'll do it. Um, I'm a little nervous about adding that many knobs. Yeah, but then some, some poor guy is going to want to have a different runtime period for each of, you know, many tens of RCU K threads. Well, you could derive it from the other values, right? Uh, maybe. What, like, uh, if, if we've set our syscuttle to be four seconds and whatever it is, 5%, you could set your deadline to be 20 milliseconds every four seconds. I, I could, but um, I, again, it depends on how far, as you said, it depends on how far you want to push it out to the edges. And yeah, no, the thing is, the thing uh, is if people aren't interested in pushing the edges, they just take the default, which is well, uh, no, but I'm saying as a default, you could do that. And it would adapt oh, okay. to the tuning. Okay. Um, but that would, so the, let me make sure I understand what you're saying. What you're saying is instead of being scheduled other by default, I can be scheduled deadline by default and um, make it so that my deadlines are a function of the, of the various system things that are set either by default or by the user. Uh, but at that point, I've got myself in a position where I'm kicking my contact switch rate through the ceiling, which is the reason people don't like using SCED FIFO for the RCUK threads. Okay, so I 
I can have that be the, the first, uh, so that's a valuable thing. I could have it be the first line of defense for, um, as an intermediate thing between K-FIFO and whatever the heck you would do for a data line, I'm not sure, but have it be a, another level of automation saying I'm a little bit worried as opposed to sort of this priority. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, this is why the previous conversation about like, can you have a fair and deadline at the same time? It's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Steve, do you remember a hack you did some time ago that in the when you receive a timer for dispatching the the RCU stall, you raise the the priority of the RCU thread for that CPU? Do you remember that? What? Yeah. That, that might be a solution could, for a could problem. I, could, you, could you say it? I didn't follow if, that entirely. Could you say it if, again? If you, if you are about to have a, like if you are one. No, that's not a solution. Okay. <laughs> but, but I well, was let, clear. Let him tell me the non-solution. It was Steve's hack. It wasn't mine. It was Steve's idea. Well, stop yeah, arguing, but, but, stop but, arguing but about whose idea. That's why I asked him. Ideas. But you started off at the wrong point because if you, if you think that anything oh, Stevens comes up with in a hurry is a solution, then you're doing it wrong in the first no, place. No, my intention was this joke. <laughs> okay, so what? Just, just for you my trick me again. Just for my edification, what was Steve's non-solution? Uh, if I recall clearly, it was an internal rack that we have on our kernel at Red Hat. One tick before a possible stall, stall, mm -hmm. stall we the interrupt oh. raised the interrupt. The interrupt raised the, the priority of the RCU okay. thread that was that about to explode, and then it ran. Okay. Uh, well, if it makes you feel any better, Thomas, that's what I would have done if it, somebody whacked <laughs> me over the head and told me that I had to fix it like now. <laughs> or Steve, for that matter, if it makes you feel better. <laughs> Got to do something, right? Um, Thank you, Daniel. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's a service we provide. Okay, so we've gotten down through these. If we have this, I don't know that syscaller needs to do anything <laughs> because we would have the, have the uh, set scheduler yell at it if it did something stupid, uh, whatever stupid means in this context. Um, Bandwidth, we've been talking about ways of sort of kind of doing the bandwidth throttling as a group in, in odd ways, um, kind of, not quite. Um, and uh, I, I haven't heard anything new through the conversation, but maybe I just haven't recognized it. So what, what, have, what have you guys discussed that doesn't fit into one of those boxes? Um, just to add, uh, actually, well, using the the four uh, solution, so the new deadline server thing, I was actually thinking that uh, if we have that, and so CFS tasks can actually run using basically deadline, then the RC throttling uh, doesn't. That can go. That, that, that can go, right? Mm -hmm. That that's actually nice because yeah. basically it's uh, it's implied. So it, yeah, I guess that's an, that's another point to probably have right. spend time on that. I, th I think that a solution for the attribute that requires is something like a lib Lexis first uh, schedule or a this a tell. So, so uh, where was this? Dubrovnik. You were there, right? No, I was. You were. Uh, so, um, at that point, I proposed uh, combining EDF and lib Lexis first to do multi um, level. Yeah, multi, multi criticality. And, and apparently that wasn't new. There was a paper on that somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we've got a couple minutes left. We could do a few more questions, um, or we could, uh, you know, beat people to the whatever it is they got a break. If I can't remember, coffee at least. All right. Going once. Going twice. Break. So it's time to start uh, the next one hour and a half. So the, the next topic is the rework of the load balance on which I am working on currently. Um, so I have prepared a few slides. So yeah, one is a status and the other one I have three open items that I'd like to, to discuss. So just for those who are not really aware, so there is a patchet on AKML about reworking the load balance. And uh, the main change of that, uh, now we have more a level of type of classification of the group of CPU, instead of just overloaded imbalance or misfit. So I have mainly added one, so we have as capacity, 
fully busy overloaded and all the special, I would say the special case of imbalance, uh, asymptotic packing or misfit. <clears throat> That's one difference. The other main difference is the type of migration. So until now, you can, uh, we were only able to move some load and now you can select. In fact, depending on the, the case and the situation, you can either continue to move some load to try to balance the load mainly when you're overloaded, but you can also decide to move a task or to move some, uh, some utilization. So that helps us to, to have a better um, um, way to, to balance the, when the system is not fully overloaded. I mean, typically for the, the, the case where the system is overloaded, that should not change a lot of things. But it's mainly when we are mid-load or light-loaded case. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, several uh, stable thermal test placement have been uh, fixed, like the one task per CPU which is now working correctly, as far as I can tell. Also, we have a better spread of the task in the C group on NUMA. And I don't know if Phil is there, but yeah. So I worked with Phil about testing, making sure that now we have a well-balanced system on NUMA when you have some C group with load and normal task. And also the fact that uh, if you're prevented by your RT task, the CFS now will be moved to an idle CPU, if any, which was not the case. Uh, <clears throat> one of the change uh, that I've done also, so I am using the load average instead of the runnable load average, which is one thing that I would like to discuss a bit more with you. So my understanding of using the runnable load in the load balance, it was mainly to fix the case when, when you have a huge amount of tasks slipping and blocked, a group of CPU can be seen as overloaded, whereas there is almost nothing running on the, or runnable on the run queue. That was there for that. Um, with the new load balance rework, um, because we are not only looking at that, the load, when we are looking at the load, it's only when we are overloaded, which means that all the CPU are used and fully used and more than used. So in this case, it makes sense to come back and look also at the block load. Um, and so yeah, for me that's the only case where we, we were using the runnable, but maybe there are other cases that I'm missing. Uh, so part of the problem there is, is the runnable is, is what's the, um, the best part? Yeah. yeah. There we go. Uh, part of the problem there is w one of the things we discussed before where we strictly do it by weight, where we probably want to actually go by like NR running, then by weight, then yeah. by util. Right, right, but I'm just saying, without, when you just go by weight, yeah. Uh, that's when you need runnable load here. You could use block load if you had the NR running pass first. Okay. Because block load tells you what might wake back up. Yeah. But w when you're just going by weight, yeah. Like so, so this can be un. I'm not saying it should be, but I'm saying it could potentially be undone by your patch. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So I have on the load balance. Uh, part, so I have replaced the runnable by the load. I'm seeing some um, performance improvement in the test. So I have tried to make sh to, to split between um, the improvement linked to this change and all the ro runnable workload. So there are some improvement thanks to both change. But moving back to the load makes some improvement in the fully loaded and the overloaded use case. Um, so that's why, um, and I'd like to go further on that. So I have also a patch for the wake-up pass as well, where I have removed the runnable as well. Having in mind that now we are, we are looking at idle CPU first, which is quite similar to what we are doing with the rework on the load balance. So we have everything which is, I'm looking for idle or spare capacity first, and then if there is not, we assume that everything is overloaded, and we take into account this block. The only things that have not been done and I haven't looked at is the NUMA statistic part, which is still looking at the renewable. But that's probably something that we should have a look, I should have a look as well. I mean, because I think that it's just a matter, yeah. And maybe I, I just wonder for the NUMA statistic if we should go further and do something more like what we are doing in the renewable. If they are the node overloaded or not, or we should just stay on the load. I don't know, to be honest. I'm not an expert on NUMA, and I'm not sure that what really makes sense 
from a policy point of view for the node. So if you have any advice here, don't hesitate to, to raise. So yeah, we'll have to look at it again. Okay. From the test for back when I was still working on UMA stuff, uh, I found that leaving a CPU idle is almost always worse than getting locality wrong. Okay. So I think the direction you're going with the load balancer in general is probably the right direction for NUMA as well. Okay, good, good to know. Some of the patches. Some of the performance patches we carry are exactly in that direction as well. Okay. That like, the generally speaking, the L1 and L2 is so small relative to the L3, even on Skylake, that the time to rewarm it okay. is always lower than the time to wait in practice. And I saw another benefit. So if we are able to remove all the runnable load, so we have a discussion with the, about the flatten hierarchy after, which means that even for that, that will remove one of the reasons to go through all the hierarchy. Right now, when we are in queuing and dequeuing, we have to maintain this runnable load. And if we are not using anymore, we can skip it completely, which again gives some more benefit because the load is just about when we are migrating the time. So yeah, that, that's another, um, reason for which I'd like yes, to go more in that direction. I mean, unless, yes, there are some, uh, some good reason to keep it, but uh, that I haven't seen any, any problem for now. Yeah. It works. Um, so yeah, if we can completely get rid of it, that, that would be very good. Okay. Yeah. I was curious about the comment, like the cases that were fixed by its introduction, wouldn't those regress? Or no, well, why not? Th those cases are fixed by the fact that we do a pass based on NR running. So, so um, the load balancer used to only look at the load numbers. Um, and, in, and then when you're um, idle, it would see a large load due to the block load even though there are, were no runnable tasks, and that will confuse the thing. But now we're first looking at number running. Are there runnable tasks? Okay. If there are, then we'll look at the utilization. And only in the overloaded case, when everybody has enough load to do, we'll, we'll look at the actual load number. And in that scenario, the load average is the right number to look at. The reason it's nice to look at load average there is blocked average. Like, in the case where you're overloaded but have a local idle, you're just trying to patch a local hole rather than fundamentally move the balance of the system. Yeah. And the block load gives you a nice proxy for how much load you expect to wake back up onto that CPU, which we have to throw away when we can only look at runnable load. So, okay, so that was for the first item. So we have 30 minutes. We still have 20 minutes. The second one is the detection of the overloaded state. So right now we have as capacity, fully busy and overloaded, and some other special case. And uh, <coughs> the point is that in some case, we fail to clearly detect if a CPU is overloaded or not. So that the, this is a simple trace. So I have just run Agbench, which mainly just overload the system. And what you can see there, just to show the, this kind of problem. So on the top, it's all the tasks that are scheduled. So we can see that on the CPU, we always have something running and sometimes a lot of things. And then that the metrics, so it's the util average and the utilex. So mainly the utilization of the CPU. And we can see that even if the system is almost always busy with something, in some case, so that's a 100 millisecond time slice, time window. We can see that the util average and the utilities can be below the threshold saying that we are not fully busy and, or, and overloaded. And that's mainly because when we are migrating the task, we are migrating the utilization, which is useful for us to know when we are not, over, when we are not overloaded. But in the case where the system is overloaded, the utilization no more reflects what the task want, but just what the task can have access to. Um, so there is a distinct lack of idle time. Yeah. There's a dis 
Yeah, so there's a distinct lack of idle time. And um, I seem to remember that for CPU frequency scaling, we also have a measure uh, where we accrue idle time. So yeah. maybe we can abuse that to detect the lack of idle time. And otherwise, maybe we should look at a different Looking at the idle time can be an idea. The other point was about, so just, yeah, what do you? I was going to add, um, after we chatted in May, I played with something here as well. Uh, there is one more trick we can do on the pelt signal. Yeah. Where um, we can expand the period, but on updates where we haven't had an update in a while, I count that update with a longer time delta. Okay. And you effectively can get a signal that is re as responsive as the current signal on change, but much more stable around sleep and wake because it effectively has a, l you, can, you can dynamically make, you, you can, I, I played with some ways to change the math yeah. so that you can make the period dynamic. Yeah. The while having the, with, this, with the current numbers. And it actually looked pretty reasonable. The Mm, the problem I see that if we play with that is that utilization is used for the frequency scaling. And in some case, we want to scale that. Yeah, no, no, but what uh, I'm saying is you can make that signal more, like it, it is a way to, to expand it to cover. Okay. Yeah. So that we don't get, like the problem we have right now is that when we have an idle, we drop too much or we gain too much as we. Uh, not in this case. Part. In this case, the in fact, the CPU, the task is always running just because of migration in this case. But there are other cases where we see okay, the signal yeah, moving yeah. too much. And I'm saying oh, you mean uh, in addition or instead of the utilis? Right I'm now just saying yeah. there's, there's, there's a way to make the okay. signal more stable. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I have a thought. Yeah. Hello. <coughs> is it working? Uh, no? Okay. Hey, I, uh, I had a question on, um, so if they're always running, why isn't util average utilis pretty high? Is it, I mean, if something is migrating out and something is migrated in and it's running, shouldn't it all be high anyway? Uh, in this case, just that, uh, I mean, um, we are migrating something out because the utilization can be more than the capacity of the CPU. So are, like all the threads, like new threads, that's why the utilization is low? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there they're is. Not, like, they're not long running threads. They're all a bunch of new threads and the long running threads are getting migrated out? No, yeah, that's just because of all the migration that can happen. That's why we, we are in such situation. Okay. So, so, for example, if you have five always running tasks, yeah. then they'll all get a 20% utilization. Yeah. Even and, and your CPU will be 100% utilized. Then if you migrate two tasks away, the utilization will instantly drop to 60%, right. even though your CPU will never be idle. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. it will then just need to readjust back to 100%. So if you have a lot of migration back and forth, you'll get these okay. jumps okay. in the utilization. Okay. So, and that's where I'm coming back to. So, we still have the util average and the utilis there, and that's the value of the load average and the runnable load average. And we can see that it's really high. So, in my case, all my tasks have a nice value of zero. Um, I will just explain. It's just that the main one main difference between the runnable and the and the util average is that in the runnable we are taking into account the waiting time of a task. Which means that if you look at there, it means that we have a lot of waiting time in the, on this CPU right now compared to the utilization. So even if the utilization is low, but your runnable value is high, it means that a ta some tasks are waiting for quite a long time. So. My goal would be to see if we can use that to mitigate. It means that typically, if there is no waiting time, the runnable and the util average should be quite similar and should be exactly the same uh, if we not take into account the wait. When we start to be above, it means that we have some waiting time. That doesn't mean that we are overloaded, but until some point. So maybe the, the tricky point will be to, to know exactly what is the threshold to say, okay, even if the utilization is low, we are overloaded because the waiting time is high. But that's something that I would like to have a look, to have a better view of when the system is overloaded and to compensate this kind of mig migration. And if we are able to remove this runnable load average, which means that we remove one metric and having this runnable uh, 
runnable time, not the load because the load is no more involved, can be used instead. Having in mind that in this case, the goal is not to have the that each time we are in queuing and just queuing. It's more like the load average value. So that's something that just have to be updated when we are migrating tasks and not all the time. Um, so I think you kind of already hinted at this when you're explaining it and I, maybe I didn't get it properly. Yeah. So in the case when say util, average and utils are going down because say two big threads migrated yeah. away, you only want to do what you're trying to do if it continues to have significant amount of load, yeah. right? Maybe after that, whatever gets migrated and it's going to be just two tiny tasks yeah. and you do want to let the low, uh, util average come down. So how do you plan to distinguish between one happening versus another? No, I, I will not switch. I, I just want to look at both. I mean, it's not, the point is that if you have a low utilization but high runnable value, it's mean that the tasks were waiting to run on the CPU. So, so okay, in the case you must let them fill, fill this new available. So when, uh, after migrating a task, you have some spare capacity that will be filled by, by this waiting task. So, so you what must are the waiting tasks are just like tiny tasks? Uh, in this case, in this case yeah, that, that all the tricky point is there. So but normally the runnable should be low if it's some tiny task because it will not wait that much. Okay. And so, yeah, and to continue on that, that's some statistic that I have catch. Uh, so this is the mainline, this is with the patch set. So I have tracked each time we have run uh, some, um, we are getting the statistic for doing a load balance. So here are the different uh, type of um, the characterization of the group. So for the mainline, we have only the three. And for the, with the patch set, we have more. Here is the number of times we have done, some, uh, we have computed the statistics for, for the mainline in the patch set. So we can see the difference. So we can see that we have migrating some, uh, as capacity stayed there as fully busy, which is a good thing. We have also reduced the number. I can't really explain why we have reduced so much because it's on the same time window but we have reduced the number of time we are computing the statistics. Maybe it's because we are fully, the CPU are more, are better used, so they are busy and um, because we are increasing the, ba the load balance period when we are busy, we are doing that uh, less often. Um, and that's another place there. That's, I think it was uh, Valentin who raised that. Right now, when you have more than one task in the CPU, you can either you detect if that you have, have capacity or you are fully loaded. And in order to say that I'm fully busy, you must be exactly at uh, the value of the threshold, which doesn't really make sense. I mean, we should have some tasks there. It's mainly because right now the, um, the range, it's not a range, it's just a one value. And we should extend this range. I mean, I would say we should not remove this, we should extend the range. That's the point. So that's uh, just that for now, with the current metric, we can only detect for one value. But we should find a way to extend, to have more task, to have more time, the fully busy, busy state. So to compare more often. And that will probably remove this kind of situation more. Because it means that even with Agbench, sometimes we have some CPU with no running task. That can happen because we have a lot of blocking and waking up tasks, but I think that's a, uh, we can even do better. So that was just to, yeah. So I like that we can probably do better in the moving the CPU in the overloaded or fully busy state. Yeah. So as I understand that, you seem to be using a lot uh, the utilization of the CPUs as yeah. a criterion. Uh, and maybe this fits in some of the things you said, but have you considered rather than using utilization, using uh, the waiting for CPU time uh, the average, so so it's basically using the wake up latency as a as a uh, a way to uh, figure out uh, from which CPU should I pull tasks to put put the, them elsewhere. So ideally, the the CPUs that take more time between the wake up and the moment the task runs, those are the ones from which you want to pull tasks. Uh, so that it might be a different metric you could use instead of utilization. So. Um, there is two things. When we, uh, in order to select the CPU where we want to pull a task, the load average includes this waiting time. 
because okay. in the load average we have the runnable time. The runnable is that oh, it's not only the running, but waiting also the time you are waiting for a CPU. Okay, perfect. So that's. Um, Thomas, uh, do you mind speaking in the mic? Yeah. yeah it might still be, still be worthwhile um, to split that out and compare and contrast what happens when you only look at the wait time, at the accumulated wait time at this moment. Okay. Because. Yeah, but uh, you mean you uh, looking at each task? If your wait time goes, no, you can yeah. accumulate it. Yeah. Uh, in the scheduler. So if your wait time goes up, then you have obviously more work on that thing than you can fit in. It's not only a capacity problem. So you have one thing which is taking a full yeah. time slice and then you have five other things which might be just taking a, a, a fraction, but they still have to wait. And if you have another CPU where you have five runnable tasks, but the average wait time is very, very slow. You don't want to pull because yeah. they, 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 can, they can nicely fit there. So it, it might be worthwhile to, to look at that as a separate experiment and, and okay. see what comes out of there. Yeah, you can have a look. But for me, clearly, the renewable and the load average, that's, what is, it, that's part of the matrix already. I mean, if you have only some really short running task or waiting task, the load average will be lower than if you have a long waiting time. Except that it's not, it's not a microsecond value, it's just a, a range of value. It's just a, right. not the point. But it might, might be interesting to do yeah, that it, yeah. Maybe, yeah. We can, we can have a look. You want to say something, Peter? Um, having a look can't hurt. But yeah, like, like always, we want to avoid dying by the number of statistics we track. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, I, it was just for, 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 for having a look at. For having the information. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> in the past, in Solaris, uh, was, if I recall well, that was an option for user space, reduce interval, which was a loving. So if, if you're expecting to have high load, you may say then, okay, until my wait time for CPU did not outpass this value, don't migrate at all. So okay. there will be no CPU idle. Or if it will be, it will be busy in few in few milliseconds. So this at least you, you avoid this migration problem. So Okay. Yeah, that's Few minutes for the, for the last item. It's the fairness. That's something I raised at OSTM, and it's not solved in the current patch set. It's just that when you have so that's the typical example: n plus one CP task on a n CPU system, which means that you can't balance the system. And right now, what drives the migration of the task between all the CPU? It's the number of failed. So. Every time we have the load balance, we see that one CPU has more tasks to do than the other. So the, the balancer tries to pull this task, or to pull some load. And then when he decides if he can, if he can't balance, and after a number of time, we'll force the migration, saying, okay, even if we, have been, we haven't been able now, try to do so and see if it that help for the next load balance iteration. And the other, the other metric that trigger the load balance is the, if the imbalance that is computed is uh, just below the, the, the load of the task, half the load of the task. And so for the second one, it's clearly a matter of rounding the load average value and so on. So just to say that right now the migration is random. And even that, I mean, at some point there, I haven't showed that, but when this one migrates, in fact, almost all the CPU try to catch, to pull the CPU, the task at the same time. And it's mainly a matter of cache, the CPU being faster than the other one to take the lock and pull the task. So it's clearly random. And for me, it's a problem because if we are random there, it will be even more random in complex use case. So I haven't found any solution right now. I just want mainly to raise the problem that how can we ensure a better fairness instead of just expecting a random migration to, to solve the problem? So if you have any idea, 
Uh, so a, a global runtime approximation yeah. would allow you to fix this. Yeah, that has to be a global. Yeah. And this is what's all. I see. <laughs> Uh, just out of the curiosity, so if you find that the imbalance is only one task, yeah. why don't you just not migrate in this case? Perhaps it does not matter that much. Because of the fairness, all, this, all the tasks have the same nice priority, so they should all have almost the same weight. And in this case, you can see that these two tasks have half, the r half less running time than the other one. There is no reason why they should run half time less, or only the half time. Yeah, but I if you ping pong the task over various ca cache lines, you're actually destroying the system performance rather than improving things. Yeah, but uh, if you have one of these two tasks, you would like for to, p to force the migration. I agree that for these those tasks, they are, they are they are fine. But if you if your task if your group C group is there, you will have less throughput than the other one. So so the people that care about completion times for their batch jobs, for example, they care. They want all their tasks to complete at roughly the same time. And if you slowly migrate the one task around equally, which yeah. doesn't happen here, then all the tasks get roughly equal compute, and then they'll roughly finish at the same time. Um, whereas if you keep them on the same CPU, then they'll run 50-50, and your worst thing the worst day compu uh, completion time is like twice what it would otherwise be. So we, we don't want to ping pong the task around at a high frequency, but we want to rotate it around at a low frequency just to. But you need a global runtime signal to do that. You need yeah. a global signal. So another point about the fairness is um, maybe it kind of goes to Peter's comment about having a global VR runtime. Is that if you're having little and big CPUs and you have four, uh, say eight big threads running all the time, yeah. the ones that get stuck on little, they get like way lower performance yeah. than the ones on big and you can just rotate them all, it would be better. Yeah, that's also another thing. That's another common case you need as well. A big little system, the one that have been put on the little core they are unlucky compared to the other one. Yeah, in that case, you'd have to include yeah. the compute the capacity, capacity in the into the. Yeah, that can be uh, quite. Uh, yeah. That's another another step. Yeah. yeah, we are. Out of time, maybe for one last question. We have only one minute, no more. Or we can continue after in the old way. Okay, thank you. I have a presentation that explains how all the flattening of the run queues for the CPU controller works. That presentation is tomorrow. This is mostly me asking questions uh, on how to solve some odds and ends in the code that I really have not figured out yet. Um, with two very quick slides, giving the fastest intro I could come up with on how the CPU controller is uh, structured today and what I am kind of sort of changing it into. So what we have today is every task has a SCAD entity and every C group has a SCAD entity on every CPU. And when we have something like Pulse Audio, which System D puts way down several levels down in the hierarchy. Um, when it starts to run, the SCAD entity of the process gets enqueued on the C group run queue. Then the SCAD entity of the C group gets enqueued higher up, and you keep going up 
the hierarchy. And at every level in the hierarchy, we look at the, all the scheduler attributes of the thing. So we look at the VRun time. We track the amount of CPU time used. We look at the weight and the priority. And then after a few fractions of a microsecond, when Pulse Audio goes back to sleep, we do it all over again to tear down that hierarchy. Um, for normal desktop workloads, it is not too big a deal. For many server workloads, it is also not too big a deal. But there are some workloads out there that have maybe 10 or 20,000 contact switches per second per CPU. And the overhead of doing this stuff all the time is prohibitively expensive. <laughs> That's the plan. The plan is to do as little as possible and make the scheduler a little lazier. Um, so what I'm doing is parking it all hierarchy off to the side. The hierarchy, the C groups themselves are never on the run queue. The running processes themselves are on the run queue. And one of the things that the code already does is compute a hier hierarchical load for each task. And just like that, I can also compute a hierarchical weight for the different tasks. And I can use that for the task priority, the same way nice levels are handled today. And the runtime can be scaled the same way it's handled for nice levels today. Today, every time we run a task for some amount of time, where this is the, the, the amount of time in nanoseconds that it ran, we increase the virtual runtime basically by nice load zero divided by the weight of the task. And instead of using the task weight, I now have the hierarchical task weight. So if you have a task that is inside a low priority C group, it would be treated similarly to say a, a, a task with a high nice level. And it seems to mostly work, but there are a few uh, catches. One thing is the preemption code that we have today, it does some things that work well in normal operation, but when you have different tasks of wildly, diff of wildly uh, different priorities, things kind of fall apart. And I would like to ask people some questions on what I can do about that. Uh, specifically, the, the runtime difference is caused by all the tasks that ran on the CPU since the woken up task uh, went to sleep, not just by the current task. And on the other hand, the granularity of whether or not to wake things up depends only on the priority of the woken up task. And that can result in things like deciding to preempt a task that just started running because some other task used the CPU before. And it can, also it can also result in a high priority task preempting a really much higher priority task because the priority of that second task is not used at all in these calculations. And, oh, yeah, the priority of the task that is being woken up is the only thing that determines the wake up granularity. The priority of the task that is currently running does not matter. And the priority of the other tasks that help accumulate the runtime while this task was asleep also does not matter. Oh. Okay. So yeah, uh, what I was saying is that uh, usually um, the priority of the tasks which are currently runnable, they are taken into account in the skit period that is uh, skit slide that is computed. At the point. Um, except the skit slide that is computed for preemption, uh, it's as done by uh, wake up gram, which is the calc delta fair thing yeah. on this slide, 
and that does not take the currently running task into account, only the woken up task. No, uh, that's in the... Um, this is in uh, wake up preempt entity. Yeah, but in fact you have the skip period and if you have this gentle first slip, something like that, and you take half of the skip period, that's where, that place you, how much you, you will preempt the currently renewable. Yes, but the, that amount is scaled here, and if we have a high priority C group, yeah. then that number <coughs> may be reduced by a lot. That number that um, place entity comes up with, with the gentle fair sleepers, might be reduced by another factor 10 in this function if we have a task from a high priority C group. And at that point, you can have a task from that high priority C group interrupting another task from that same C group because they are both really high priority. So um, it's been many, many years. Um, but much of this code um, predates C groups. And I agree that for C groups it does weird stuff. What I can remember is that this was um, an attempt to make nice tasks, so, so heavier tasks, more eagerly preempt uh, non-nice tasks. And this was mm -hmm. fairly important at the time because X ran as minus five or something. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, this is a long time ago. And what I'm wondering is not really what the code should do right now, but what the behavior is. What is the behavior that people want from this code? Do people want higher priority tasks to preempt lower priority ones? And when looking at equal priority tasks, um, do you want something that slept for a longer amount of time to wake up something that's been running? The preemption problem I'm actually more concerned about is not this but the case where you have a task, like you can have a high weight group and a task in that group not get much of the H weight, which will actually de massively depress its preemption priority. That's actually, I think, the more concerning case. That's definitely an issue as well. Uh, I've got like questions on that in uh, the next slide or the one after that. Kay. But because I, I feel like yeah. this one, like this one, is, there's some hand waving in the first place, uh, and, and you can maybe argue about how to make the hand waving right. But that other case, I don't see. Well, with this one, right. I'm wondering mostly what behavior would people like to see from the preemption code. Not necessarily on how, but what would you like it? How would you like it to behave? Yeah. So traditionally, there there was the expectation that a a higher priority, so lower nice, would also run faster or, or have lower latency. Um, I don't, yeah, <coughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Sort of. Yeah, so uh, this is a remnant of that. Um, as soon as you have a task migration, it's all bonkers. And, and just real quick, uh, I was wondering, you know, you keep asking, like, what's the behavior people want? And I don't think people care about, like, what's the preemption thing. I think people care more about use cases rather seeing, okay, make the modifications and see that's how. Because a lot of times we say, oh, this sounds like the best thing to do. But once you get it into real world practice, everyone says, why is my mouse jittery now? And um, I mean, a lot of times, a lot of the cases way back when, when this code was written, I can remember it was just like people, the responses we got from a lot of users was just, my desktop seems smoother. Uh, what does, how do, you, how do you measure that? The, so we, we've touched on this in a few other discussions. Without global rerun time, this one's actually just a total random number generator because it actually just depends on your parent group entity, which is plus CPU. And that is gonna have totally random placement based on whether you're on, you're on the CPU or running previously or on a new CPU. Yeah, so but this code, the no suspect behavior I saw was when a, basically what happened is that a task in a group, a high priority group was sleeping for a long amount of time 
at which point the V runtime advantage it gets over the min V runtime is capped yep. by place, uh, place entity. Place entity with gentle fair super, yeah. Yep. And then at that point, because calc delta fair scales it down further, um, you ended up with something so short that a task of that priority would almost always preempt another task of the same priority. But you could argue maybe that's fair if it's been sleeping for a long time. Um, it's with my code. With the hierarchical code, it does not happen. But I mean, if it's been sleeping for a long time, you probably want it to have high preemption priority, right? Um, that is fair. Well, in this particular the case, the CCTL, min granularity, was set to a larger number than the maximum number that place uh, entity allows, mm -hmm. which should effectively disable the preemption for same, uh, for same priority tasks, mm -hmm. but it didn't because of the way this code works. Right. And I think that's correct. I don't, like, yeah. I mean, the alternative to, um, there's two hacks that I tried for this. One of them is scaling the VDIV with the priority of the current task. The other one that I tried is scaling the V runtime advantage that place entity allows. They both seem to work roughly the same in the test that I did, where high priority tasks still preempt lower priority ones. And with, a, and with the wake up granularity larger than the maximum amount returned by place entity, you end up never preempting a same priority task. I, I would posit this is probably like number three or four on the problem list. Fair enough, let's move on. <laughs> and the other um, ones are harder. Yeah, this one is harder. Um, Calc group shares has nice ramp up logic where you always end up with a non-zero weight. We do not have anything like that in update CFS our QH load. Uh, for task H load and task H weight. I'm wondering if you want something like that there or if we should have the ramp up logic in a different location, Spe especially for task H load. Given what you're doing with it, we, we do need it. Um, okay, I'll look into adding that. Yeah. Neither of these fix the problem I mentioned just now, right, though. No, no. If you have a low weight task and a high weight group, its H load will be low still, and its preemption priority will be inverted from where it should be. Mm. Yep, I will have to look into that as and well. And I don't see how you fix that. Um, it mathematically breaks. Okay, um, I think we can fix that the same way H load cal calculates that. We can, we can come up with a way for that. I think you have another problem. That I think there are two big problems, that and uh, low priority groups, you're going to give them way too much time. Yep, you were right, there's a bug there, and I think I know how to fix that one. Okay, we, we can, if you only have a minute left, we can yeah. talk after. Um, Another thing, um, right now on NQ, I walk the hierarchy all the time, and that ends up being about half of the overhead of the, uh, of the new code. And I'm wondering if I can get away with not walking if the last time we walked, there was a task on there, so we know the weight of the group. Last one is just CFS bandwidth stuff, which is not as. What is no more break yet. That's fair. Oh, this. There is the talk tomorrow where you can continue yeah. discussing this. Yeah. Yep, tomorrow at five, I'll uh, actually explain what all the runtime stuff means and an overview of the stuff I'm doing, except for the th CFS bandwidth stuff, which seems like it would be a little too much for the other talk.
Th that is a uh, doc tomorrow, right? Yeah, yeah it's tomorrow at five. Yeah, we can move on to the next session unless there are comments on this from by people who know how the CPS bandwidth stuff works. Sounds good. All right, uh, I guess we can start. Uh, you might have noticed the title changed from what is announced. Uh, that's because I hadn't written my slides when I submitted that. And now that I've written them, I probably would change the title again. Uh, the idea is uh, I'm going to describe some weird topology we have on ARM servers and then talk about some way of perhaps generalizing a way to handle those quirks and change the way we build uh, sketch domain. So, yeah, if you don't. If you're not familiar with SCAD domains, it might be a boring talk. So the server I'm talking about is uh, SunderX from Cavium. Uh, it's two circuits of 48 CPUs. And the topology looks something like this, which looks OK. You have your two circuits, and you have the new model at the top. Uh, the thing is, I have trust issues, and so I didn't fully believe in that. Uh, even though on the box it says you have two boxes of 48 CPUs, I found some random paper that said that it's not the case. Um, it was really only hinted by the paper because all it's doing is it's describing the circuit as a box with eight smaller boxes in it. Uh, and that's all the information I had. So I started from that and I used LMBench to try and see like the dependencies and the um, interactions from CPUs to CPU. So the idea is I do every combination on every CPU. I pick one CPU running some memory operation using LMBench. And then I try to place a similar task on another CPU, and I try all of the combinations. The idea is, if some CPU is sharing some resource, like maybe some interconnect or something, the bandwidth that I get will be lower than if they didn't. That's the gist of it. And using that and some fancy hierarchical clustering, I can generate what is called a DEN program, uh, which is a tree that represents dependencies. And so what I can see is, I have eight trees of six CPUs each, and that's exactly what was in the paper. So they didn't describe their method, they didn't say how that should even exist, but I could confirm that their little boxes was something that I could reproduce in uh, reality. Um, and the numbering is a bit funny. It looks like it's as if there was SMT6 uh, in terms of the numbering scheme, but yeah, it isn't, it's uh, plain SMP. So if I actually represent that, in the scan domain, I would have done it like this. So you have your eight MC domains of six CPUs each. You now have a dial level because it's not the same as MC, so it's not degenerated. And then you would have NUMA and the other circuit at the right, but as you can see, it doesn't fit in the slide. Um, so you get some improvements for that. Of course, so for Hackbench, you get better runtime because if you have smaller masks, it takes less time to run. Don't be too impressed by that minus 25% because the single core performance on the Cinderex is abysmal, it's really bad. Uh, the only pro it has is that it has 96 of them. But so yeah, if on one CPU you're scanning less things, uh, you have a bit uh, of runtime improvement. And on memory bandwidth, I would expect to see some better results when you are not uh, overloaded or overcommitted in tasks because then you have a better use of your available bandwidth instead of having tasks that are contending with each other. But I couldn't, I couldn't prove that with just an bench. And so now it's all of the crazy ideas that I got from that. Um, so having smaller SCAD domains might not just be for broken, uh, excuse me, special hardware. Because so uh, I'm trying to have a callback to the latency nice talk that I will have later on. Um, 
there's both sides to that. So for latency nice, what came out of the discussion is people who are both ends of the spectrum. There are people who want to scan less things and there are people who want to scan all of the things. So it's not necessarily uh, a solution. But the question that arises from that is, does it make sense to cram so many CPUs in the same domain? So in that example, in the MC domain had 48 CPUs. Is that realistical? Does it still make sense nowadays? Uh, my point being, the distance from one CPU to another is not going to be the same. So I'm not, um, I don't mean physical distance as if you take your nanometer uh, scale and you try to measure the distance between one CPU and another. It's going to be different, of course. What I mean is, if you have a, a, a read miss in a cache and it, uh, it needs to fetch a cache line and it's actually in other, another CPU's uh, cache, well, depending on how the connections are made, it might take some, uh, some more time and less time. Uh, the question there is, nowadays, uh, on upcoming architectures, what's the relevance of uh, network and ship and NUCA in a single socket? Uh, from my discussion with some other people, they expect or they suspect that what Cavium did in that socket is that they might have a cache habitat shared between some of the uh, CPUs, which would explain where we get that. But so we're starting to have something where does it still make sense <coughs> to still have our three hard-coded domains? So, of course, it's by default. There are some architectures that we differently. Uh, AMD dropped the die, and S390 have five domains or something like that. So you could do that per architecture, or you could try to maybe generalize this differently. Um, if you look at ACPI, the ACP spec, you can describe the topology as crazy as you want with as many different levels as you would want. Uh, on ARM64, for the topology, we just squash everything to make it fit inside MC, uh, SNT, MC, and I. But so maybe we could change that and have something that is a bit more clever. Uh, I picked ACP as an example, but it could be something else. <laughs> there it is. Um, so like you say, it's per architecture. And I mean, if this makes sense and the measurement shows that it does, then, then go for it. I mean, you don't have to squash it all together. I mean, if there's an actual topology there, then describe it. That's what they're for. So in this case, uh, the LLC is the die? So if I go back to, uh, yeah. The, it's, uh, so it's very nice uh, old hardware. The LLC is just an L2. You have L1 and then shared L2 between all of the 48 cores. Yeah, and that's also, uh, that's why we, we did some changes in the topology to be able so that we can supersede the, the different number of levels. So right now it's used per architecture, but yeah, yeah. Well, you, I mean you can that's build, what, I mean. That's what S390 is yeah. doing. If ARM64 thinks that it should dynamically discover more So the levels. question is, is that really just ARM64? Can we expect to see that on other architectures? That would be the question. Would it make sense to have some sort of generalization? Yeah. So the problem is that uh, as long as you reflect hardware topology hmm? size, then you won't get Yeah. Yeah. Um, so AMD has something like this. Is that the subnuma um, clustering or? No, no. Um, it's it's how they build their chips. They they have small clusters as well stuck together. Um, other manufacturers might or might not have something like that. I don't know. Uh, and so another thing with that is if we have some sort of information. So uh, in here, I just speak like yeah, distance between caches or with distance being an arbitrary distance you would define. We could improve some of the properties we have. So like one I picked is the like inbundance percent between the SCAD domains because right now it's hard coded values. Uh, SMT it's has one value, MC has one value. You can, uh, you can. Uh, but it's per architecture. No. Then you could, okay, you could try to make something where the architecture defines how you could set it. Uh, but I mean, from a user space, I mean, uh, it's then it's, um, that depends what you want to do. Th some default value of s have been set, but uh, as far as I can tell, it's not hard coded. It's just that we, we have to start with a value. So, 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 so getting actual useful topology information yes. from architectures is non-trivial, yeah. um, and this is how we ended up with, with the three defaults. Um, but I mean, just build whatever you need for ARM, and if there are more architectures that 
start to extend, we'll look at unifying some of it if it's if it makes sense. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, question in the back. So uh, ARM did find, define an ACPI table specifically for this. Um, well, it's called the, the processor. <coughs> PPTC. Processor, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But mm, by definition, that table is not strictly for ARM. Yeah. It is described any CPU topology and, and the cache structures associated with it. So I, I think a lot of the information you need is already present. It's just acting on it. Uh, so when I looked at the ACPI spec, you have lots of information on the, uh, oh yeah, okay, so it depends on what kind of information you need. I think most of it for the caches is like uh, numbers of sets, numbers of ways, but then I think it's the way you would build your hierarchy of your nodes in the PPTT table. You could describe something that is more than three levels. Well, right, and, and the table is supposed to be able to describe, um, you know, which, what your clusters look like, how wide they are, how deep they are, yeah. how the caches are actually associated with those structures, and and unfortunately, the way the, the current uh, topology is described in the register, we're, I, I know we're getting it wrong on, on Thunder in particular. So, so on ARM, you can forget about the topology in the register. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a lost cause. <laughs> right. I mean, but I mean, it would be something to, to investigate is, is if there is something specifically missing from that table, then let's just add it. Because um, not only ARM is using it, but I know other architectures are considering it. Um, that might not have in the past. They use some CPU ID thing. Um, and then there are some new up and coming architectures that are considering using it as well. So you, you may as well go with the standard, right? Yep. All right. So we yeah, all, all this trust in ACPI just makes me sad. <laughs> I picked ACPI because it's the only thing we can rely on. I mean, we arm. Uh, this is such a sad, sad I know, world. I know. I, but it's, it's better than having nothing you can trust in. Well, my condolences. <laughs> Thank you. Every time we have to only to ri rely on ACPI, we are doomed. <laughs> Welcome to the wonderful world. <laughs> right, uh, I think we can move to the next talk. I don't know how much time I have left, but I think I'm close to the end. So, thanks. Okay, so, uh, so this is basically a talk, uh, uh, ju ju just an extension of uh, OSPM uh, talk that I gave regarding the turbo scale. So uh, uh, for the newcomers, I will give a short introduction that what I wanted to achieve. Uh, I wanted to do basically task picking so that I can have a fewer number of cores active at a time. So. Um, so that uh, less number of cores are active and I can save power budget in there and thereby I can sustain a more frequency or the turbo frequency for a longer duration of time. So what I basically did is that uh, we cannot do the task packing for all the tasks. So I will do task packing for only a jitter task, which I say a jitter is like some uh, operating system noise or which are unimportant tasks which should not be given a higher frequency. And that can be packed on a core. Uh, on, on a busier core, which is already running a few number of tasks. Uh, so the first thing is that we will classify a task. How we will classify, we can do. Yeah. So uh, how we will do the classification is, uh, uh, there are two approaches. We can do manual classification or we can have uh, automatic jitter classification, which is a difficult thing. So. Uh, the first thing is we will do t task classification. Once we have classified the task as jitter, we will try to find uh, a busier core. So we will we will search for a uh, non-idle core basically across a domain 
that domain is still a challenge that which domain we should pick up a LLC domain or a die domain which can be different in different architectures. So uh, we will try to find a core uh, which has some capacity left uh, to accommodate this jitter task and which should not be idle. So what should be the core capacity is a new challenge uh, that I wanted to face. Uh, uh, and we will try to pack a task on a on a non idle core. So this is what the algorithm will look like. Uh, when we have a task, let's say 12% utilization, we will try to find a core uh, which has a spare capacity left and there we, after picking a core, we will try to find a uh, idlest CPU inside a core. So this is all overall, uh, overall algorithm and uh, I have shown that uh, uh, I am able to get a 13% uh, performance benefit uh, on IBM Power9 system with a tuned workload. So uh, uh, and the currently the RFC is in V4 state. Uh, so, th there are three challenges that I wanted to discuss here. Uh, one thing is a core capacity computation. Uh, how we will define the, what is the capacity of a core? So currently what I am trying to achieve is, I will try to find the capacity of each CPU, uh, SMT capacity of each CPU, CPU and try to aggregate it based on some uh, formula. Uh, so what, what is the objective for this capacity calculation is that, three objectives is that, I wanted to find a select, uh, I want to find a non idle core or some busy core. Uh, which should not be going to be idle soon out. So it, it, like I can select a core which is having 2% utilization, but should I pick that core? So we have some kind of threshold like 12.5% or uh, more utilization if a core has, then only I, try to, I will try to play, uh, place a JIT task on that core. Uh, I want to find that whether it has enough capacity left uh, to pack a jitter. Otherwise it doesn't make sense to overload it too much. Uh, so this is what the formula I use. Uh, I try to find the capacity of a first CPU and sibling. So it is basically all the, all, the, all the SMTs are of equal capacity. That's what I consider. And I want to scale it uh, with the respect to the number of online threads in a core. So uh, I, I, the K, the factor is a linear factor which is having 1.5 for SMT4 and SMT8 it has a, a K equal to 2. So I, I wanted it to be two times the capacity of a single thread uh, for SMT8 core. But, but that's a yeah. That's a lie because That's Power9 doesn't have SMT8. Uh, Power9 doesn't have, but the scheduler has a uh, view of uh, SMT8, right? So that is like basically it fused of two cores. Or like some yes, big but how about Power8? Because for Power8, it is an actual SMT8, and it's K a will not be two. Uh, my experimentation has shown that it is equal to two. Uh, it's more or less equal to two. I cannot say two, but yeah, it will be like 1.8. Uh, or that, around that. It's a lot less than two. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it, it, it depends on workload, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's the question. Like, what should be the uh, core capacity, or how should we define a core capacity here? So, Vincent, yeah. read us of capacity a while ago, and I was very glad to see it go. Yeah. And and here you come again. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes me sad. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I removed that also because the information was uh, there for one pass, but at runtime, if you are using the frequency scaling, you were no more able to catch this because the SD value was not there or it was not no, null by default. So that's why. So even if you revert what we have removed, even if you re even if you re revert what we have removed, you will still miss uh, a part in order to be able to get uh, the, the capacity, capacity of all the core. Yeah. That will be capacity of a CPU. Yeah. But. No, the capacity I of the core. Big. Uh, 70 capacity, yes. Uh, yet. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yes, but I wanted to just find whether a core is having enough capacity with respect to other core. I mean, inside a core, I just wanted to pick an uh, uh, least uh, busiest CPU, maybe the idle CPU. But, but you have the, the ASIM thing, right? Yes. Uh, Power 9 still has asymmetric threading, right? Power 7 has, yes. Oh, Power 8 and 9 no, don't anymore? Uh, no. They are symmetric again? They are symmetric. Okay. Power 7 has asymmetricity uh, across cores. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, 
we, we can go with SMT capacity, uh, like uh, because we do in load balancing, right? We do SMT capacity calculation for calculating what is the capacity of group. Uh, since we just need to uh, compare it across the cores. So, okay. Uh, so, other thing is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we need a classification uh, whether a task is cheater. Uh, uh, we have, I have tried two approaches for manual classification, a C group based implementation and a syscall based implementation. Uh, from syscall, uh, we can say that a particular task is a jitter or not. Uh, C group seems to be a good thing for distro guys. Uh, Syscall is a good way for kernel community as I see. Uh, I think this is a generic challenge for latency niceness and uh, uh, UClamp faced that by adding a syscall first and now trying to do for C group. Uh, what should be the procedure uh, is, is a question to community as well. Right, so um, we had that discussion with Uh, the other stuff. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, um, latency nice, of course, but also the stuff you added. What's you it called again? You yeah, you climb. Um, and and Tegan has has expressed that previously as well. Um, he really wants, and I think that makes sense to have per task properties first, mm. and then do a C group interface for aggregate tasks, yeah. things. Okay. Yep. Fair enough. Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, you don't run the system, do you? <laughs> Two weeks. Will the last uh, operation then override, like, if a task sets its own uh, via the syscall interface and then it moves to another C group, which has a different value? So yeah, th that one's interesting. Um, so for nice, for example, it is a combination of two. So that's a multiplication. Um, it's a task weight times the um, C group weight. Uh, with U clamp, mm -hmm. it is an aggregate clamp. Um, uh, the the C group gives you restrictions, and the task is allowed to move inside of that. Um, for this, I have no idea. I, and yeah, I still hate the whole jittery word. I mean, it's just. Um, yeah. I yeah. still have to figure out what it is. Yeah, or, or why he wants this. I mean, you just want to idle the entire system, or? Uh, I, I remember asking this in Pisa, and I forgot again. Uh, so, I mean, I basically want to ta do task consolidation and uh, doing it for each. What, what is jitter? I mean, yes. I know what chitter, I know what chitter is in in terms of uh, if you look at a periodic uh, uh, timeline or something like that. But mm -hmm. uh, I can't for the hell figure out what uh, task chitter, uh, what a chittering task means. So, so uh, for me, uh, the task is a jitter when uh, it is a sort or busty kind of workload, and uh, it doesn't matter for me to give it a CPU. Uh, fastest or uh, a frequency, a more frequency to it. I mean, I should not wake up an idle core for a small kind of workload. Uh, that kind of workload, I will say, as a jitter, uh, some kind of operating system noise. Uh, some yeah. Uh, I think like background I, job. I, I but also background think job. background job. Yes. Uh, I think he's talking about really yeah. tiny uh, running threads, not just background, because you could have a background thread running for a long time, and I yeah, don't but, think he would want to. But they call it. it short running background threads and not shit that, because that's exactly. confusing yeah, the hell out that. of me. Yeah. He's, what, he's actually wanting a short running thread because he doesn't want to keep as many CPUs. Yeah, off. and, and, and the short running thread, which doesn't matter, which is background. And small is what he wants. Yeah, yeah. short-running background tasks. Yeah, uh, that uh, describes it well because that's what it is. You don't care when it runs or where it runs. You just have to run it occasionally. And one of the properties, it's you know it's run short. 
So by some definition of short, mm -hmm. and if you do that and give it a, an interface which, which lets it claim I'm a short running, I don't care task, then actually we should look at it if it's, better, if it's really short running and clap it on the finger if it's not. Because then you create other problems. Yeah, uh, being short doesn't mean it's unimportant. Like my short friend sometimes is very latency sensitive. So you can back uh, so, uh, no, for your if, if your short running task is important, then don't call it a short running background task because the background task is by definition not important. Right. That's a yeah. Another problem is yeah. That's a that's definitely definitely a problem. Another problem is you classify. It looks like you have a like manual classification, right? Uh, so what if you classify it as short background running thread and it actually runs for a long time? So yeah, we what, should yeah. whack it over the head and kill it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have your microphone and. <laughs> and if if task is not short running around. Uh, we can pick a short, run, uh, short running task on a core uh, with the fact that uh, it won't uh, hit the performance of other tasks running in the same core. Uh, but, but yes. from what I remember at OSPM, you had a secondary objective that was to stay in the turbo <coughs> mode for as long as you could. Correct. And that's why you wanted to consolidate that's why, correct. onto a single core. Onto so then the other thread, uh, the other core on the CPU can idle and that's how you get a bigger boost. Yes. Short versus long. Yeah, well, I mean, if it's a... Can you I just want to introduce or say something. Um, why do we need to tack them? Why can't you just look at the Pell's value? If you, if you know what, exactly what your turbo yeah. schedule is, I think you can work out for how long the task should maximum running for it to make sense or below how short it should be running to make sense to pack it. Something like that. And that should be somewhat proportional to the Pell value of the task. So you could just put in a filter saying that if the Pell utilization is less than X, then mm -hmm. you just pack it. If it's bigger, then you don't. Yeah, it's correct. I Except it can decay though. Except yeah. there are people that have very short running services, but they do uh, care about latency, mm. so they don't want queuing. Yeah. yeah. So short running, nice task. So you right. cannot just look at the utilization number. Yeah. So I I heard that uh, in V1, uh, then I shifted to manual classification. But so yeah. initially it's we have yeah. It's yeah, <clears throat> there is another presentation probably uh, talking about the latency like noise. So if you use uh, utilization to identify a short running task and we use the latency nice as or whatever we call it, then in that case, using those two matrices, you can identify those tasks and move them without adding any, anything else yeah. apart from the latency nice. Yeah. But if this task is so short running, waking up an additional code that might be in deep sleep to actually enable your turbo state might take longer than just running the task on the CPU that's already busy. So yeah, it's, 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 to it's 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 his goal is to avoid that's what it's CPU. yeah. I the don't want to wake up an idle core, uh, not an idle CPU, but an exactly. Core. So what 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 is the harm in always packing them? P Peter was was saying that for some tasks you don't want to pack them for latency reasons, but is it always better to uh, to wake up another call if it's in deep sleep? It might not be deep yeah. Well, if it's not in deep sleep, then you're probably not in turbo anyway. Yeah. And, uh, we, we have something to keep in, yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is many of these workloads also want consistent latencies. They don't want very high tail latencies. And yeah, that may not help that. Uh, we have <laughs> We had something uh, similar we tried. Uh, actually, we what I did is uh, a pack on the idle cores, not a pack on the PC cores. So still do the uh, idle selection, but it, it was more picky on the cores. So what is the goal in that case? You want to reduce the number of IDs. You want to increase the number of IDs. Can you pack it on IDs if it's not going to be needed? You can just uh, interleave. <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah. yeah, you can interleave the, them better. So you can still try to find the idle core. But you can pack smaller uh, running tasks into the course, but they don't still don't slap on each other. So can you repeat exactly what? Okay. Uh, 
repeating what I was saying earlier, if you try to pack into an idle core, it's going to reduce the number of idle cores. And his goal seems to be to increase the number of idle cores. Yeah, if we, uh, it's like um, uh, still care about the latency, but uh, you, you pack it a little bit tighter. So it's not like packing into a busy car having to wait in the run queue. So but you say it, idle, you don't really mean idle. What do you mean is low utilized CPU? Is that what you mean? Uh, if you do the average utilization, it can be a higher utilized. You pack them into higher utilized CPU. But uh, on the on wake up selection, you can still pick an idle CPU. So the kind of dynamic okay, consolidation. Respond to that, but I don't think that's what you want. No, it's not. It's just you know, as yeah. I'm alternative. This also look quite similar to the ES, where we try to pack some tasks on yes. one CPU. Have you tried this year ES and Power Model? Yeah, I have tried it out. And uh, okay. But it tries to do it uh, for a single uh, core. Right, or a single frequency domain as, or power domain, yeah. uh, the terminology. Okay. But I want it to be the least number of cores uh, to be active as possible, and not the exactly one. So I just wanted to decrease the number of uh, active core, online co uh, busier cores, basically. Okay. Or I want to idle out more number of cores. Uh, yeah, but maybe this but can be extended. Yeah, that's what I, in OSPM I uh, propose that if we have some kind of framework like EAS uh, for servers, which seems to be difficult as of now, because uh, its complexity is way high for servers when the number of CPUs increase. I think the EAS is uh, not meant for more than eight yeah. CPUs. So and let's let's continue this discussion yeah. in the hallway so because we're out of time. Yeah. So, so one, one more thing. Um, you need a capacity. Yeah. Um, you, you need a capacity to find out when your core is full, right? When, uh, yes. Could we not use the exact same? heuristic will get out of load balancing because we just uh, two presentations ago had that okay. same question. When are we full? Uh, Less for some people, but. <laughs> uh, when, when the core is full, uh, I, I will say that, let's say for SMT8, uh, when two of the CPUs are full, or a 74, 1.5 times the CPUs are full, uh, then I want to bail out. Uh, or I don't want to pick that core, or something like that, because. Yeah, but, but that should be more or less the same point where we switch load balancing from utilization to overload. Yeah, OK. Yeah. OK, okay. I'll, OK, we'll talk offline. Uh, Thank you. Hello. Is it working? Okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'll talk about uh, task latency nights. Uh, so this is uh, still in very nascent stage, uh, both in terms of ideas and implementation. So most likely we'll have more questions than answers. Uh, so uh, I talked about the wake up scalability problem uh, last LPC and showed like we had a heuristic. Uh, so the problem there was uh, a heuristic to solve it. So the uh, problem uh, I talked about was uh, workloads where we had very short running threads, uh, maybe like few microseconds or maybe just hitting double digit microseconds, uh, for example, OLTP workloads. And uh, the wake up path uh, in uh, select idle CPU, uh, it can uh, end up searching the entire last level cache, uh, which is getting bigger. So we needed a way to control the search cost because um, for short, short running threads, didn't make sense uh, to spend too much time uh, searching. Uh, and select idle CPU was uh, part of the problem. Uh, so the other issue was uh, there's also select idle core uh, that is also a bottleneck uh, in such scenarios. Uh, so how to fix that? Uh, so uh, in uh, OSPM this year, uh, we had more brainstorming and uh, we kind of there was a consensus that uh, we can 
solve it by uh, task latency nice uh, that is a new uh, property uh, scheduling property that we can introduce so it is like nice uh, but for latency so this will give us a mechanism uh, uh, to uh, uh, control the property but uh, then in the under the hood we can map uh, this mechanism to multiple uh, uh, policies and one such policy can be to uh, control the uh, search latency in uh, uh, the select idle CPU. Uh, it can also map to other uh, latency related uh, scheduling behaviors, uh, for example, preemption. And uh, uh, we also had uh, some other uh, uh, behaviors that can be mapped. And once I posted the initial passage, there are a lot of uh, discussions and suggestions uh, that I'll get to later. Uh, so implementation wise also it <laughs> generated a lot of feedback. So uh, I have the same problems as uh, uh, the parts mentioned like what is the interface to choose. Uh, we can have a system wide uh, interface uh, like sys, uh, proxies, kernel where I have the, all the, uh, uh, the scheduler tunables uh, right now. Uh, we can have a per task uh, sketch set attribute and definitely have a uh, C group interface uh, by having a, a new uh, file CPU latency nice that's shared uh, by all the tasks in that uh, C group. And there are also a lot of discussion uh, about what should be the valid range uh, and the default value. So Peter seems to think uh, that it should still stick to the, uh, the existing nice uh, range that we have and the default so I think uh, we had this Should discussion in the middle. We could change the name and no longer have to worry about the minus 20 to 19 because I suspect that range might not be enough. Yeah, so my argument was that if you call it nice, it had better behave like nice. Otherwise, you're just confusing people. Okay. So, 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 so we are on CS 101 right now. How do you name things? Latency nasty. <laughs> <laughs> That's a better name, actually. <laughs> So, okay, uh, but one thing I conquered that uh, we probably don't need a too big of a range. Uh, I think Patrick suggested uh, that 0 to 1, 0 to 4, uh, that was probably an overkill. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, what is the default? Should be like right in the middle or it should be like uh, in the minimum or the max? Rick has a... I mean, if it's in the minimum, then it can always increase. Shubra. Yeah. I, I'm somewhat confused about what you're trying to accomplish because the idle core search algorithm stops when it's found in idle core. Yes, but it can. Which means that yeah, but it can if fail. you yeah, it can take a longer time. But if you end up missing an idle core because you stop searching, your latency will be much higher. Uh, no, actually, it helps because you. It, in this case, it might help because uh, you have wasted your a lot of time. So it hurts more than it helps overall. So is that for, if you, if this is for workloads that have very short time slices, yes. uh, right is time. there something that you could figure out automatically, hey, this task here reschedules every, oh, it reschedules 10 times per millisecond. Let's just sit here and wait. Yeah, or, or something like uh, the average runtime of the tasks uh, probably can also be used. So yeah, uh, online running can be used, uh, but uh, yeah, this is still uh, up for discussion. Like, should it be specified by the user or should the kernel figure it out automatically and do the right thing? I think everybody likes low latency. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, that. I have heard some people like predictable latency more than low latency. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> and the, the, the select, uh, the idle core search, uh, I, I have no idea whether that can be made faster because faster in this case is very tricky. It also includes like touching as few uh, cache lines as you can. So uh, probably many attempts can be made uh, to this, but uh, I would suspect most of them will fail uh, once you try out. <laughs> Actually, all your workloads, you'll see probably it doesn't work uh, as you expected. So 
uh, there should be some way to disable uh, the uh, the select title core uh, search uh, at least have a skate feature uh, to disable it and the other question uh, uh, just before i get to the, the other question in my mind is uh, uh, via this latency nice uh, uh, property should we be uh, controlling uh, or changing any um, uh, first order behavior versus second order behaviors and by that i mean so in one of the discussions in the email uh, patrick suggested that uh, the select title code can also be disabled if uh, the latency nice value is below a particular threshold but in that case we are uh, completely changing the qualitative behavior of the uh, scheduler rather than moderating a secondary behavior which is uh, searching more or less whereas in this case like we are saying we will not for search for idle codes at all which is a qualitative change in the scheduling behavior so should uh, any kind of uh, kernel uh, scheduler tunable control first order uh, behavioral changes so that is something similar i think paul uh, in ospm we are having a lot of discussion about this uh, uh, what is that what a what is a tunable meaning so there is a lot of back and forth so I have like similar questions also uh, now, and yeah. It seems like you are dealing with a trade-off yes. when searching the course, searching for an idle core, takes a large fraction of the runtime yeah. of the task that you are looking around for, and the time until the current task on one of the CPUs that you walk. It's going away. It's very short as well. Yeah, it's like. Uh, that seems like those are all things you could measure and automatically figure out a threshold that works for the different programs. Yeah, in theory, but uh, I have always seen such kind of online uh, learning uh, has uh, it. It has been like uh, in previous. Uh, I used to work in Solaris before, and we had we had some feature like that called transient thread, which used to try to find out whether a thread is transient or not, like the jittery tasks. The, and uh, we had a major problem where the online, the learning was not exactly correct and it was falsely, the kernel was falsely classifying certain threads and it became an ongoing problem and we could never really like fix it. So that's like uh, a risk. But yeah, definitely in theory, we can explore that. There, uh, there are also other cases where the user space is informed and knows when the when the role of a task in the system change, and uh, and you can feed this information to the scheduler by, for example, changing this value and change the way you 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 actually manage a task at wake up time, L like the Android background. Yeah, exactly. So one of the idea was uh, we can try to use this mechanism, for example, to wake up a task in a in a code path or another, depending whatever is the the specific role of that task in a, in a certain moment in Android. So kind of related, I mean, I, I do think we need a better mechanism for a background task, a batch task. But I only really understand how to do that as one, prior, one background priority. I don't understand what the other values between 1 and 18 would mean for a, for a value like this. So, uh, so initially, I thought was like, uh, at least for the, uh, the searching cost, we can map it to how much to search. Uh, that gradation. How, what does that mean? I mean, how many CPUs? Let's say minus 20 means you will search one core or one percent of the LLC domain. Map it to some percentage uh, of uh, the total LLC domain searching cost. I don't think. I don't think that makes sense. I don't think the numbers are in your favor. For uh, one possible usage is, I'm not talking about the range which has to be defined, but like when we do VRAN time normalization for a task at wake up time, depending on the relative value, we can decide if we want to give more priority to a task or another in terms to avoid uh, the waking up task to preempt a currently running task. I, I, I agree with that. And so some kind of like range I, helps. I, I do think we need like, for example, a better background task mechanism. Yeah. But I, I think the better way to have the discussion is to go in the opposite direction and say, what are the classes you want to have? Right? Background task is an example of a task, of a class. Are there others? Rather than trying to say we're going to have this like generic 40 yeah. value range, 
Yes, yeah, so in Android, yeah. for example, they distinguish between background or if it's a system task or if it's an application task. Uh, so there is a little bit of variability. Yeah. So the, the idea is just to come up with a mechanism which is generic to well, account for uh, possible I'm saying users. before you come up with a mechanism, come up with the classes and then f figure out how your mechanism yeah. maps those classes. Sort of a profile, really, where you, you define a set just of profiles. A, a human decomposition of what the problem you're trying to solve. So that you mm. can actually map that to an API rather than yeah, but uh, you were assuming like there will be like four discrete classes, uh, it, yeah, it no, might be. Uh, yeah. Guys, we're time's up. Okay. Okay. So we need oh. to get going. Or and uh, AG is officially kind of over now. Um, just a few last minute things. Uh, yes, you wanted to say. Yep. So um, before I hand the uh, mic to Steve, thank you very much for attending. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to all our speakers. <laughs> The discussions are not over yet. You know, keep going on talking about it in the hallway. Uh, boffs are possible, and of course, the mailing list. Um, also, the hackathon room, which is totally empty a lot of the time, can be used for important questions too. So, so for those who did not hear Rick, uh, there's a hackathon room which is empty most of the time, and you know, maybe that's a place to go have more discussions and hack some code out. Okay. Yeah, and um, okay, so. You don't have to film this or anything, but just to let you guys know, uh, reception is downstairs. It starts at 7 to 9 o'clock. It's hors d'oeuvres, drinks. Uh, it probably may not be enough for Ooh. you to, for dinner, but there's a lot of restaurants that are open late. So, uh, And it's also, everyone heritage. should have received a link about voting for the tab elections. Everyone's got that. Please vote. Uh, by the way, I'm running, Steve Rosted, so please, you can <laughs> hey, I, mean, I got the mic, I might as well use it. Um, but if you want to talk to me about more about the tab, feel free to, uh, to calm me down, I'll be in the reception area. So thank you very much, and uh, enjoy yourselves. <laughs>